Uh, so, uh, it's good to finally get to see all of you, or hear all of you, I should say. Um, I am your dungeon master. You may call me Nick, if you'd like. I, I know you guys are kind of used to seeing my username as Rex, so. so. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Oh, I know who we're missing. We're missing, uh, same The Dragonborn. The Dragonborn. Whoa, whoops, that was the wrong button for sure. I think we might stick with Rex just because there's so many names going around between that shy guy, Nick. Right. That'll get confusing. <laughs> So, right, I'm going to try and get a hold of him real quick and see if, uh, if I can't get him online. Yeah, he's like always listed as offline, but still around. I just never know. Yeah, right. So, if you guys could, uh, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Uh, let's start at the top with uh, the chaos there. Uh... Not sure what I can say that you guys don't already know. You can just call me Chaos. Prefer to keep things simple. All right. My name is Kendall. Uh, I'm Canadian. I've started DNDing during the summer, and I'm a big fan of it. Uh, this is Epion. I'm going to be playing your Lodafall Archer. He wants to unite the clans. Uh, hey, I'm Josh, your friendly neighborhood barbarian. Be the team. I don't know. Yeah, I was gonna say. So, uh, uh, Josh, you're playing Breck, the uh, half yeah. barbarian, awesome character concept. I love your character concept so much. Yeah, I'm psyched to play it. It should be super fun. Uh, I've I've played something very similar to your character uh, before. Uh, I had a uh, a character named uh, Garuk, who was a uh, half orc zealot barbarian. A lot of fun. Yeah, that was the other potential subclass for me when it came down to it, but we won't go that exact route. Then we have, uh, so let me make sure I'm uh, pronouncing character names correctly. So I know, uh, Chaos, you're playing Zara, uh, which is not the full character name. Um, very hard to pronounce, very drow. <laughs> uh, but fantastic character concept. Then you and Epion are, are going to have a shared backstory, correct? Man. We never really nailed anything down, so maybe, maybe not. Depends what works best. Okay, yeah. If you guys, uh, you guys can definitely because uh, once again, we're uh, uh, first actual game is going to be next week. So, if you guys want, you can. If you guys want to uh, figure something out like before then, that's perfectly fine. Uh, if you guys want, we can even nail something out tonight. And work on that. That's up to you too. I mean, it's the same for any any character here. Like anybody who wants to figure something out, I'm I'm open to ideas. Right. If it helps, the pronunciation is Zarebrin Ilana. That's the full name. I I thought it was something pretty close to that. Um, but you know, with with Drow, it's really hard to tell. Um, I I think a lot of people have issues with Drow names. Uh, a lot I mean, of are... it wouldn't be 
She wouldn't be a proper drought if she didn't. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, I think the last drought character I made was a character named Yosephine, uh, Yosephine Febronk, um, which is pretty tame for drow names. Especially seeing as I was playing a, uh, a female cleric of uh, uh, Illustrae. Oh, yeah. That's good, though. It makes sense <laughs> that that would be someone with a more navigable name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like that um, I, I like that thought with Illustrae being uh, pretty hard to pronounce. Uh, especially whenever you just look at it and you're trying to read it. You're like, how do you... Uh, I actually, uh, whenever I found out about Illustrate, I had to look up how to pronounce it properly so that I wouldn't look like uh, wouldn't look like an idiot whenever I was talking to people. <laughs> about your own god, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I'm just going to just tell people, yeah, my name is Serebrin. Uh, it's spelled the way it's pronounced. Okay. And then just let them figure it out. <laughs> uh, we have... Uh, okay, so... Uh, we also have... Uh, Epion's character is Belogorn. Uh, Cicillari? Yep, that's it. Nice. And uh, uh, Belogorn is a fighter. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing focused on range? Yes. Very nice. Yeah. Are you, you don't mind the classing, dude. Uh, I I don't have any issues with it. I was gonna say, um, I'm. So, uh, you guys, uh, we've talked quite a bit over the last like couple weeks, um, and I think I've brought up maybe once. Uh, I I am a DM with a little bit of experience. I've been DMing for a decade and a half, um, twenty years in the actual game itself, and. The uh, the kind of people I'm used to dealing with in my like my IRL games are absolutely insane. Um, so I my I, I played a lot with my uncle, um, who makes the absolute craziest characters I've ever seen. You can also pretty much uh, make him any character, and he can play it. It is impressive, to say the least. Uh, and then the last, uh, probably about a year and a half ago, uh, is whenever I started getting into 5th edition. And whenever I started getting into 5th edition, I ended up uh, going to my group of friends and telling them that I wanted to host, and learning a lot about 5th edition through that. And when I showed up to host my first game of 5th, they were all like, oh yeah, man, we got all of our characters built, this is going to be awesome. And my roommate, who's um, 60, decided that he was going to play a pixie paladin. <laughs> and I was like, that's that's super cool. Then I showed up to, uh, to my friend's house, and all of them had built bards. <laughs> <laughs> You're banned. So, um... Literally uh, walked into uh, that that band life, and that was that wasn't Storm King's Thunder. So it's a helpful adventure to have a lot of faces in. That sounds so bad. <laughs> it it was fine if it weren't for the fact like they all were playing uh, bards of like different colleges. And it was just, it was kind of actually hard to deal with that. Like, dealing with that many bards, um, it's it's hard to, it's hard to even use the actual encounters in the game to make it a, a difficult encounter. Because <laughs> there's, there's so many support characters <laughs> that can just do things. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, it was kind of a wild ride dealing with that. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure what's going on with Meta, but uh, for right now, I'm going to just go ahead and introduce uh, Meta so that people kind of know the the person that's missing. Um, so you guys know that Meta is playing the Dragonborn Fighter Saint Wee, <laughs> and is uh, also a fantastic character. I don't think that any of you have made a character that I don't like. Uh, there are characters I don't know a lot about yet, but I, I'm really looking forward to getting to know all of them. Um, though, I, I am going to say, by background, uh, I <laughs> no offense to any of you, by background, I would have to say that my favorite character is probably Candles. Well, the Great Valdos is an extremely great character. What great, can I say? The Great Valdos is a wonderful character. <laughs> um, all of you... Uh, so what I've gotten from all of you guys, I've actually written uh, quite a bit... Like, Okay, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and explain this to you guys. I have a lot of trouble uh, writing out campaigns. Uh, I do have a lot of the campaign information that I want to go over in my head and basically just try to make bullet points for what I want to do. And I, I just find it really hard to, to take full notes um, for campaigns because I end up, instead of trying to write a campaign, I end up trying to write a novel, <laughs> which isn't what d d is about. It's about, you know, co cooperative storytelling and uh, nice fun tactical combat it's understandable i tried my hand at, D at uh, being a dm i did not and i wrote like dozens and dozens of pages for every single session uh i would say so what's kind of weird is that i i do spend a lot of time uh once i kind of pin down the, camp the campaign that we're going to be playing, I do put a lot of time and effort into kind of going over in my head and thinking about the kind of thing I want to put in front of the players. Uh, which, apparently, is a, uh, like a lot of people don't agree with the, the DM style that I have, which is, uh, I, I do kind of ad-lib most of what I, uh, most of like the things I say and, and what I do. And I think the reason that I end up doing that is because it's just kind of what I'm used to. Every Whenever I started DMing, it was literally, I walk into, you know, I walk into a room full of friends and they go, Hey, you're hosting tonight. And there's, whenever that happens, there's not much that you can do about it. You just kind of do your best, you know. Uh, you... You try and make the game as fun as possible. I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> any good group of players will probably figure out ways of breaking your campaign anyway. So mm -hmm. being able to ad lib it is really the way to go, in my opinion, when it comes to DMing. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. <laughs> so I have no problems with you ad libbing the, the hell out of this because um, I can't speak for everybody else, but I will probably do something wild and crazy and unexpected um so just go with it <laughs> i've done it before so i'm just letting you know now one of uh, uh so just so i can answer this real quick uh one of our we do have a viewer currently um which is one of the players from my previous live stream who asked why his character is still in the uh overlay and to answer him real quick um your character is still in the overlay because i was too lazy to change the settings before we started session zero. <laughs> um, so let me go and fix that real quick. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, I, I just forgot to change my overlay. <laughs> but yeah, I, I've watched a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people work on trying to do the, trying to, to put a lot of work into like pages and pages of you know information that never really ends up getting used i think the only new notes i'm going to probably end up taking is i want to get 
um, like a list of NPC names, maybe. Uh, so that way I have a list of names ready. And then, you know, from there, just try and ad lib to the ad lib to the best of my ability because like i do have um like characters planned out and uh the hooks that i'm going to be throwing at you guys planned out it's just you, you guys know how that works it's it doesn't yeah. always work out the way you want it to yeah then well the <laughs> the npc list is pretty much one of the only things i do that isn't ad libbing aside from like general stuff i mean otherwise you just end up with a bunch of characters named like table glass as a question for you <laughs> and it's the word uh i think one of uh one of my favorite things is just being able to be like oh yeah um because i i would have people I, I have this all the time where people are just like oh yeah what's this uh what's the name of this guy who you know, does this random thing. Like, I, I think whenever I started my, my last campaign, um, somebody asked me, they were like, what's the name uh, of the guy that's renting horses in the stable on the way out of town? And I was like, oh, yeah. Um, and just, you know, said a name. It just came to me, right? I just named the guy and then put a little bit of, you know... Uh, well, this guy's, uh, you know, I would go, oh, this guy's, like, uh, mid-30s, um, you know, light brown hair, and then they go, oh, well, what's his name? And I go, oh, yeah, he's, uh, he's John. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember the exact name, but it was, it was just one of those things where I just went, uh, yeah, it's this guy, of course it's this guy, why wouldn't it be this guy? Like, why would you, <laughs> well, that's the way you do it. Why would you think it's any other guy? And um, the funny thing is, is like the new players were like, whoa, dude, he just did that like off the top of his head. He knew exactly who this person was. But I could tell that the, the people that were more experienced were like, dude, I can tell you just fucking made that up. Are you serious right now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's better than just saying one of the characters' names. Like, oh, this is all those <laughs> this, this, people just, hands. <laughs> Just say one of the character names. Oh, that would be hilarious. You guys walk up and you're like, oh yeah, this uh, this bar wench, what's her name? Oh, Zara. <laughs> just... Bitch, I'm gonna cut you. You took my name. <laughs> just starts a cat fight right in the middle of the bar. <laughs> um, So, uh, let me make sure everything's up here correctly. Okay. Uh, so just to let you guys know, I have changed. Uh, originally, um, we were going to be calling the campaign, uh, as you guys know, uh, Humble Beginnings. But I think that I'm going to hold off on using the actual Humble Beginnings, because I do plan on hosting that very specific campaign in the future. Um, I have changed the name of the campaign, which you guys uh, can either look at or, or whatever. But uh, the new name of the campaign is A Place to Call Home. Because I figured that with uh, like the characters that you guys are playing and the backgrounds, that that would make a little bit more sense. Just seems to be uh, a little bit closer to what you guys typically are playing, or, or typically have been telling me about your characters. Just Sounds seems good. to be. Uh, What was that? Sounds good. We can do it. Yeah, I was. I mean, I really like. Uh, I really liked the idea. Uh, so, what what kind of happened with that? Because uh, I don't know if I've actually went over this with you guys. So, I I did decide to change it, uh, and the reason why was because uh, I realized that we had started straying quite a bit away from what I was originally going to host. And I went, but I really like this. This idea is so cool to me. Like, what you guys are doing. And so I was like, alright. Um, yeah, I guess we can do that. And I'm going to start... So I th started thinking about uh, how I could change the campaign to kind of more fit what you guys were looking at. You know what I mean? Um, 
and trying to kind of go in a way to where maybe I can just interweave backstories and maybe include characters from people's backstories as uh, allies or villains or, you know, in, any kind of other thing. Um, but uh, starting out, uh, I'm going to let you guys know that starting out, uh, I am going to be using a... Um, uh, first thing is I'm going to be using a, a part of the module during the game. <laughs> uh, I'm going to probably be doing some stuff like that throughout the game so that it's a little bit you know, less work on my end and we can have some really well done pre-made content that I can you know play around with. But it's not going to be full adventures. It's just going to be like maybe a dungeon here or you know a character there kind of thing. Also, who Candle? Were you the one that said that you had a ton of questions, like six pages of questions you wanted to ask me? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you I mean, start now or uh, you want to take a break first? Uh, I mean, if you want to ask a few questions, you can go ahead. All right, sure. Um, I, I'm just so waiting for I, everyone else to laugh at, at some of the obviously absurd questions you're probably going to ask me. <laughs> how does level up uh, work? Does it do we level up the moment we gain the necessary experience? Is it a long rest? Uh, do we have to go after a session? How does that work? Okay, that's a really good question. So uh, I'm going to let you guys. Uh, that's one of the things I plan on covering tonight. So as far as leveling up goes, for your first five levels. Um, if you, uh, as long as it's not something outrageous compared to your backstory, like, um, if one of you just decided, oh, well, I went to a wizarding school, uh, in my backstory, even though, you know, I lived in the wild, <laughs> um, the first five levels, basically, if it goes with your backstory, I'm probably going to just let you take the class. Uh, so if you're somebody that's lived in the wilds for a while, and you go, hey, I want to take Ranger. Um, you kind of, like, uh, uh, Epion, I think you were uh, talking about taking some, some class levels in Ranger, correct? Right. Yeah, uh, Ranger and Rogue, eventually. Right, so you... Same here. Uh, so the, the good thing about, like, what, about that with your characters, first off, you're a far traveler. Um, and you come from the Northlands where you have a lot of Rangers and things like that. So you going Ranger would fit really well into your into your back into your background. And taking one level in that, I could imagine you literally, you know, spending a little bit of time with Rangers and then being able to pick up on those things just from the time around them. Uh and then, you know, you have a rogue in your party. So that, you know, you guys could spend time at any point kind of helping each other learn a little bit of what the other one doesn't know. Uh, so, like, you guys are going to be able to synergize off of each other if you guys end up, pit, you know, taking some of the same classes. The other thing is, uh, we are going to do, like, once you gain a level, uh, you're going to be able to use that level immediately. Now, if you want to, say, use part of your downtime to gain levels that wouldn't fit into uh, something that synergizes from a party member or that you have from your backstory, uh, like, say, uh, Candle, you playing the Great Voldos, if you wanted to, at some point, take a level in Paladin, for in instance, um, you could very easily gain that level in Paladin just by going and spending some time in the church and starting to learn the ways of uh, like whichever paladin order you're wanting to join okay uh, so there there will be things like that that are available in the game uh, and we can always you know kind of modify that as we go uh, though I do plan on using downtime uh, one of the things is that I, I plan on kind of hosting the game um, almost as like a series of books with uh, level 1 through 4 being one book, uh, like level 5 through 8, kind of like the tier list. Uh, 
though the levels may vary from what the tier list, uh, playing tier list would be from like Adventurers League. Uh, so instead of having, you know, five, uh, what is it, four or five tiers from level one to four, or five to eight, so on and so forth, uh, you might have one book that ends at level four, but the next book ends at like level nine or ten. Uh, it just depends on what we do during that time in game. And in between uh, one book and another, I plan on taking a little bit of a break. Uh, so we might take a week or two off. And you guys, uh, and whenever we do that, we are going to take a little bit of actual downtime in the game as well. So you guys can kind of pick and choose things that you're doing in your downtime. Uh, so say uh, Chaos decides, uh, or Zara decides, that she wants to go and find this, you know, this artifact or, or this weird item that she's heard of or go on a, a little adventure on her own, then we can work that out and sometime during that uh, week or two break we'll sit down, you know, go through that adventure, um, you know, take an hour or two to play a game and cover that, that thing that you did during your downtime. have little like one-on-one -on -one adventures which we could also do of course through uh play by post by just chatting back and forth with each other in like private message or on the ser uh on one of the servers and if you guys have uh downtime that you want to do together you can always talk to me about that as well was that a pretty good answer for your question candle yep Okay. Will we be using Roll20 or another map maker or tabletop simulator or are we just doing imagination? Uh, we are doing uh, what? okay so uh, what we're doing is called theater of the mind for the most part. Now you will see um, in the, the table that we're on the stream table here uh, there is a um, a map section there. Uh, do you see the map chat there? check well yep okay so the map chat is for whenever we're doing um like any kind of boss fights uh any larger battles that have been pre-planned uh and it's also going to be where i post uh the things for like different dungeons that we do and stuff like that uh so what i'll be doing is i'll post a picture of where you guys are at in a dungeon and you guys can do your tactical combat there. I'll, I'll be updating it live as we're playing. Uh, that seems like it's a lot of work for you. It is a lot of work. Um, unless one of you guys can uh, help me figure out how to use D uh, Roll20. Because every time I tried uploading a map, it just kind of breaks on me. Uh, so it's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, I've run on it if you want to do it that way. Uh, yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah. With Roll20 20 20 is a bit limited in that if you do anything more than 100 by 100, it's going to be too large for it. Oh, that's that's fair. It's 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 a tier system. Like You have to pay for uh, more features, more sizes, more everything. Oh, gotcha. Um, and more tokens. Yeah. And but if you're going with just the basic stuff, like for most things... The default map size is plenty big enough. Um, you might have to do like multiple sections or multiple, multiple maps, but there's very few maps that are bigger than that. That you, in my experience, um, rarely do you have a fight that takes place like well over uh, that that sort of length. Um, and if you do, you can actually fake it by like reducing squares and stuff. That's that's true. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll figure that out as we're going, um, and kind of try and refine everything as we're, as we're moving. Um, the last time I have actually, uh, done the like live update map, um, which sounds kind of crazy, uh, but I did it in the middle of the dragon fight <laughs> where the, the players were running all over the place and getting nuked. And I don't think the fight actually lasted any longer than, like, three rounds. Um, if that tells you, uh, like, how 
kind of spec'd some of the players were in the, in the last game I hosted. Um, Veneer, uh, the character that's still on there, it was uh, the character run by one of the admins of the server, uh, Blue. He was actually in my last campaign. and Hey, Blue! <laughs> he, um, uh, he played Veneer, which is an incredible character. Uh, probably one of the most broken builds I've ever had to run. Um, it, it was, it was crazy. He was a, um, Envoy Warforged, uh, and the build was called Coffee Lock, which is basically a, uh, Divine Soul Sorcerer, and, um, uh, I think Hexblade Pack of the Chain? He'll correct me. I know he'll correct me if he's still watching. Um, <laughs> Uh, incredible character. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, didn't have to sleep and uh, basically had unlimited spell slots. <laughs> Plus a uh, like 27 AC by the time everything was said and done. So how do we handle play versus player? If uh, there's tensions between characters and they want to duke it out, is that allowed? Um, that is something that I'm going to let you guys decide, because I personally don't mind player versus player. But, <laughs> I know that some people really, uh, really don't like it. Um, and I, I just don't want, uh, anybody, oh, <laughs> Meta is trying to find their way in. Oh, hold on. Do I? I need to make sure that I gave uh, Meta the proper. Oh no! Did I not give Meta the proper permissions? Oh, I did. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Meta and I have a very similar sense of humor. So, I think that's going to turn out uh, awkward and fun. Hey, how's it going? Hey, hey I'm super sorry about that, man. Oh, uh, I've uh, we're okay. good. Uh, so, welcome, Meta. <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, our incredibly uh, large lizard friend. <laughs> so goddamn big. <laughs> I love that so much. Uh, okay, so I think the reason why I like saying me so much as a character, right, is just the the kind of obvious joking, like, oh, haha, I'm going to be, like, nearly the size of a giant. But, like, because it makes sense for my character to be nearly the size of a giant. <laughs> that's that's kind of what I get from saying we. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, his whole, that's his whole point. Uh, man, I am so sorry. I'm super late, man. I I lost track of time. That's a yeah. We we noticed. It's fine. All right. <laughs> so we we're just talking about uh, player versus player combat. If yeah, yeah, yeah. Game. Um, what do you guys think? Well, honestly, um, when it comes to PvP, I'm okay with it as long as it's been like discussed previously what like the limits are to it like like if player like if players are allowed to kill the players i want to at least discuss beforehand like um that like it's that both parties are okay with that or like okay yeah, yeah i see i see what yeah. you mean um so yeah, yeah. You, uh so basically like you <laughs> I know that a lot of people are going to be like, oh my god, they're already planning scripting. So, like, uh, what you're saying is, uh, uh, basically, if you want, uh, if you want dra if you want there to be drama between, or if there is drama between two characters, you want both parties to be privy to the fact that there's going to be drama. It, you don't yeah, want it to just mean be, like, like dropped. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't mean, like, like a scripted, like, alright, so look, this, this session, we're going to have this <laughs> massive fight in the makeup. But I mean, like, like, it to be, like, discussed previously, like, hey, you know, I'm not mad at you in real life 
But you know, like Senwi's pretty pissed at this uh, at this Tifling because he called him a scaly bastard type thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me yeah. too. PEP Just... is the sort of thing that, in my personal experience, tends to go very wrong very quickly for a lot of people. So it, it's <laughs> the sort of thing like you have to have a lot of trust people involved if you if you want to have fun with it. Yeah, or else. Um, otherwise, it can really people take it the wrong way, and yeah. 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 Uh, so. I, I so yeah, say, like, uh, like a as long as everybody's comfortable uh, with each other, like I, I would not recommend doing it right away. Give it some time for people to like get used to each other and, and each other's like vibe and humor and shit. Um, and yeah, yeah I, and then just like I can, said, just discuss it. Can well, absolutely. Can if Belagorn does something where you feel like you need to kill Belagorn, go for it. He'll probably defend himself to the death, but I don't mind if you try to kill him. Uh, so, right off the top, Epp is like, yo, if I die, I probably deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> I may have deserved it. If I didn't, we can talk about it later. I don't know, that feels kind of scripted to me, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess... Like, I keep in mind, like... Were... Even if seasons. you're okay with it, like other people in the group might have problems with like, oh, so you guys are killing each other and like I don't know how my character's gonna react and it's like cause a lot of stress for other people. Like you might not care if your character dies, but I might care if your character dies. Yeah, plus, and that I might cause like, a bunch of other problems. Yeah, I feel like a... at least this early on in the campaign, if our if players started killing other players, that's gonna raise a lot of issues. You know, like Three sessions in, all of a sudden, someone just ganks someone else. It's like, all right, cool. We've been together like four days, and we just lost somebody. What are we gonna do now? Type thing. Yeah, like whose party? Like which characters would stick in a party? Which would well, ideally, yeah. no one would ever Wait. think of murdering another party member. <laughs> what I was going, yeah. what yeah, I was going with this is, kind of if you want to settle a beef with uh, fists, would this be okay? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I'm I'm totally fine with, like, if one character just, like, f for whatever reason, one character just gets angry at another character and they decide to whack him upside the head with a sword or something, you know, and then they duke it out for a little I, bit and then that's that, that's fine. Yeah, I was going to say, if know. it's if it's, if it's it's something that's, you know, obviously, you know, like, you're, you're playing your character, but you're not trying to be an ass, right? You're just... Hey, you know, my character, or even if, because you can even explain it at the table, be like, hey, you know, I think my character would probably take pretty badly to what was just said to me. Um, you know, especially, and the, the weird thing is, is, especially if you guys have been traveling together for a little bit, um, even a couple weeks or a couple months, you might not have the best feel still, uh, still for who the characters are, right? Or like who, who the other characters are. But they would know, I, I feel that after a couple months, somebody would know pretty well if they traveled with you daily on what kind of things might you might find offensive. Uh, the other thing is that I think that whenever you guys, like whenever players uh, have some kind of drama that happens like that, it does tend to be much more interesting for the rest of the group for them to kind of hash it out and be like, you know what, you're like a son of a bitch i don't like it when you're like this <laughs> yeah um as long as it doesn't go overboard like uh if you feel like something's happening where it it might be getting too serious you know maybe take a step back and be like whoa guys hey like we need to talk about this and we can we can stop in the middle of game if we need to and be like hey guys let's let's talk about this you know, because I, yeah. I get that we're supposed to be here to play a game, but, like, we need to really work this shit out right now. Yeah, and, like, I wanna, I'm gonna bring up a uh, point that won't probably won't come up because we don't have one in the party. Um, I mean, Sendby is pretty close to, but, like, lizard folk, for example, in D&D &D are, like, literally described as these, like, well, <laughs> lizards. They're cold, they're emotional, they literally, like, they can't process human or, like, humanoid emotions. So, if, like, a lizard folk was to, like, right after a fight to start eating, you know, the, uh, the enemies, which is something that they do do, and one of yeah. the players was like, whoa, hold up, that's cannibalism, what are you doing, you can't eat this elf, and then the players started fighting over that, that would make sense, 
as long as like it didn't escalate to a full out like fist fight between the two players that would make sense or like if um because i know typhlings usually in DD aren't usually trusted so it makes sense if, like one of the players was super hesitant of one and then they do something that's like kind of minuscule but just out of line enough for it to justify them getting slapped with a bow staff upside the head that would again make sense even if they've been traveling together for a few months because of like pre-written prejudice against certain races I mean, hell, like the RP we were doing where it's like, here's a drow in the middle of the forest just setting up camp and suddenly a bunch of people show up with a bunch of humans. She's going to be like, whoa, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. See, like, <laughs> and and she started sense. getting like really aggressive for a good reason. Yeah, that, yeah. that I I really enjoyed uh, the, the little RP that you guys did where, uh, or well, that we did where we were kind of, you know, starting to set up a... Uh, kind of the basis of, of character, uh, general character attitude, um, and, and things like that, you know, showing things like Zara isn't cold, she's a very warm character, like, Zara's a, a seems to be a fantastically nice character, but is still obviously wary of humans, and is also very much guarded to, you know, people of the outside, because she's not sure how to take in the, those kind of people. Well, because she's a drow, like, her experiences with those kinds of people are not pleasant ones. No, not good, yeah. Yeah. One thing I definitely did want to bring up was um, on the subject of PvP is my biggest pet peeve and kind of the inspiration behind my Discord name, Metagaming. Which is something that I, like, so, metagaming happens no matter how hard you try. And there's, like, small metagaming, like, let's say, characters know each other's like bonuses um to their stats like wisdom constitution stuff like that so like oh hey we need to like we need to pick this lock oh he's a rogue let's have him do it you know or like like knowing that they're going to get into a fight so they prepare beforehand very like small mega game like that happens but when it gets too like when it gets too big is when it starts becoming a problem like um I'm trying to think of an example that's happened before. Okay, so, um, there... On, on the on the point of metagaming, and this this is something that I, I definitely understand where you're coming from, so, um, there... I, I do believe that there's a good metagaming and a bad metagaming. Um, so, good metagaming is... The first thing is that good metagaming is going to be things like, uh, you know, planning with the rest of the party. Because any time that you're talking out of character about what you're going to do uh, is, I would say, is good metagaming. But at the same time, it's also one of those things of, uh, I, I don't personally understand it. And my reason for this being, um, why are you talking to each other as players? And then imagining, or, uh, because then I have to assume that your characters are being able to relay this information telepathically. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, mm. for stuff like that, I think that it would be best, uh, if not to talk in character, um, then to at least, you know, portray it as if you're going, you know, this is the kind of thing that I want my character to portray. Uh, the other thing is that, for some reason, uh, people think that if you talk out of character at all, it's metagaming, uh, which. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's a that's a big misconception. Talking out of character is not metagaming. Yeah, that's asking, or you know, that's either relaying information or asking information. Yeah, I mean, I think that your player. I, I've honestly know. seen people like get super defensive about like the dumbest things, and call it metagaming. And I think like there's balance, like. Like, if, if you're coming up on something and, like, you don't know what the creature is, but it's, like, swallows one of your party members and, like, other people don't know what the hell's going on, if you say something like, oh, well, generally p things that swallow, like, if you do enough damage from the inside, they spit you out. Yeah. And if you say something like that out of character, like, that's a little bit of metagaming, but it's not like, oh, that's only game-breaking. And people will, like, say, oh, that's horrible. How are you metagaming? Like, dude, that person would never know that. It's like... How yeah, dare you? But... Yeah, there's um. No, that's like, dude, 
if you want to know, like, yeah, what I, can I you do you. in that situation, here's an idea. Like, help people well, out. You know, well, things like that I don't think are a big deal. Uh, big let's have some limits here. Came, would uh, would you guys be okay with if somebody knows the weaknesses of a monster to just blurt it out to everyone, or to use those weaknesses in game when your character himself would not know about them? See, that's um, that's where it gets kind of weird because, uh, like if you if you know about something, right? Like, say you know, uh, that this specific thing, which uh, another interesting thing is that people. I think that people also often get things wrong uh, because, like, I recently uh, was playing my my half orc barbarian uh, last year. I was playing through Curse of Strahd, which I don't know why I tried playing through Curse of Strahd. I've never liked um, anything to do with Barovia, but uh, I was playing through Curse of Strahd, and um, I had the thought from way back. Uh, in Castle Ravenloft, which was uh, second edition, and I went, oh man, yeah, we're fighting undead, so I can do radiant damage, and it'll, and they're vulnerable to it, which is not the case in fifth edition, <laughs> um, by any standards. Uh, I think, I think even three point five, it was may have still been that way. I'm not sure. No, 3.5, it wasn't that way. As okay. far as my knowledge goes. It was just, I, I know I've played enough of, uh, of 2.0 and then 3.5 that it was, I, I think I had a lot of DMs that still thought that they were vulnerable to it. <laughs> and so we just ran with it. Um, but it's, Yeah, it's I think just, in 5th edition it's like they're not necessarily vulnerable, but if they take radiant damage, that they can't regenerate, no, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. if uh, they can't regenerate that turn. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, the uh, yeah, they're not uh, undead. Aren't vulnerable to it anymore. They can't regenerate that turn. The um, the big one. Weirdly enough, the big one is actually like vampires. Um, because I I think that it treats the damage as uh, almost like being, taking the same kind of damage as like sunlight damage but it's one of the few things that undead aren't like resistant to is is radiant <laughs> um, but as far as uh, using a weakness like say something is uh, you know resistant to a, a ton of things um, and going oh well maybe I'll just use this type of damage um most things I feel like, uh, unless it's something like trolls, right? I don't think that people innately go, oh, well, trolls, uh, this thing must be weak to fire. Um, but you could very quickly, I feel, come to the logical conclusion as a character that that is the case. Yeah, I feel like the, the biggest thing that happens with metagaming is that players have fought like a certain type of creature for so long it's become like such a staple in low level parties that at that point they just know the weaknesses like for example at this point everyone who's ever played a single round of DD knows that kobolds are sensitive to sunlight so they get disadvantages on everything but i feel like metagaming is okay if you're like for example if you're going up against like a dragon and in your character's backstory their town was attacked by a dragon so they have a vendetta against dragons. They would obviously research as much as they can. So I feel like if they asked, hey, do I know any dragon weaknesses? In that instance, it is metagaming. So I feel like uh, it's okay because at that point, the DM doesn't have to give you like all this information on dragons. They can have you roll like, a history check to remember certain items. And at that point, you are metagaming, but it still works within the confines of the game. So it's not game-breaking. It's not like saying... Um, oh, hey, I looked up the character sheet because my character fought a dragon before. I know that they are weak to, let's say, troll farts. So I magically have a bottle of troll farts now. <laughs> you know, in, the, in, that, in, troll farts. in that instance, <laughs> that is metagaming. And yes, that is an item I created once, but <laughs> that's for another story. <laughs> See, uh, I would try to metagame it. Like, even take Banshees, for instance. If I run into a banshee, 
my character's probably not going to know enough to say, hey, we should spread out. Yeah, more than likely. But by the same token, like, once you've adventured enough, like, it becomes generally a good idea to spread out anyway, because any kind of AoE, theoretically, would be bad. Yeah, uh, yeah I, feel, I think... I think that pretty early on, depending on like what kind of things happen to the party, uh, you guys will realize that um, having five people stuck in one location is really bad. Yeah, I also feel like one of the biggest ways to avoid metagaming for fighting monsters and enemies at least is that you you don't necessarily have to say the name of the creature. I've met so many DMs that come right out the gate saying um like oh you see this massive red dragon staring you down in the middle of this dark cave you know um but i feel like that's oh. not the case because for one especially if you don't have a torch and you're just using dark vision you can't see colors but um i feel like that's also where it comes into play of um characters researching monsters that they know they're gonna fight beforehand like um for example, like if you're if you're coming down to like fight a ghoul or something that looks generally like something else, um, or like a a beholder or something, you don't have to come right out the gate and say what the creature is. You can say like for example, you when know, you come down to this dark cave, you don't have any light, so all you can see is gray because of your dark vision. You see this massive scaly beast in front of you. That could that could be a dragon. But that could also be Senwi taking a nap or some other big, you know, like, <laughs> or like a mass of kobolds. So players oh, would man, jump fantastic. to the conclusion of one thing and end up screwing themselves over. Like, for example, if they think it's a red dragon, because that's the most common type that you would face. Um, but you add in the detail that, like, it has this massive horn in the center of its skull that blue dragons are known for. But the players don't know that. So they start using, like, let's say, lightning damage. But since it's a blue dragon, it's resistant to it. Or I think, no, immune resistance, I forget which one. Um, so they end up doing less damage than they realize until a bolt of lightning drops one of them. Then you realize what it is. So in that instance, that can also be used to kind of deter metagaming. Or a, um, a really good DM tactic is to take a monster I... that's known. So I was, uh, in my in my last campaign, um, I... So I, I was describing a creature um, that had been attacking uh, uh, passerby caravans. Yeah. And I described the creature as being um, a massive, uh, you know, a massive creature with no legs and, and armor plated um, with huge, a uh, huge gnashing maw full of teeth. And one of my players just goes, is it a purple worm? <laughs> well, if that happens, like, if that happens, um, which, you could you could ask them, are they saying that in character? Uh, he, yeah, he and I talked about it, and I was like, are you saying that in character? And he goes, um, he was playing a relatively intelligent character, so he's like, no, because I don't think I've seen a purple worm. He goes, I'm sorry, I I just just asking some player. <laughs> Oh, like, well, yeah, that, okay. <laughs> in that case, yeah, it's definitely it'd be up to the DM whether or not to say the information, or you could just be like, no, 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 no. It's like a, it's something I, completely different. I don't, I don't know, I don't remember if I actually was like, uh, yeah, it's a purple worm, or if I was like, I mean, you'll have to find out, you know, yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. maybe. <laughs> Tune in next week. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next week. Um, uh, weirdly enough, okay, so um. <clears throat> My my last campaign ended very abruptly due to some uh, like major stupid drama that happened because uh, I had a 19 year old um, uh, as an admin uh, and I don't have any problems with her she was she was all right but uh, her and another admin got into a fight and it ended up being kind of catastrophic but my my last campaign ended with me literally having a purple worm swallow a player and no one knows if he survived. <laughs> <laughs> the, the campaign ended with the purple worm swallowing a character uh and then burrowing back underground and no one knows that he survived <laughs> i mean as, as far as character maybe deaths that's pretty good i can imagine that person surviving the death and just riding around now as the purple worm rider 
everything it swallows he just eats to survive. It it sounds about right for for him actually. Um. Okay, so uh, we've been talking for the candle. What's your next question? Um, would you allow players to do ta- do spotlight stuff? So, if the fighter or if the rain or the barbarian wants to go to a bar and start a bar fight by himself, or if the rogue wants to go on a uh, stealing spree in the middle of not- the night, would you allow, allow that? Mm, okay, so that's kind of a weird one for me because I want to. Okay, so. Yes and no. Um, so, uh, as I kind of explained earlier, uh, as far as like downtime events go, uh, we can always do that in you know in a in a chat amongst ourselves. Uh, but if you guys all agree, like if you go and like say um, Zara was like, "Hey, I saw this shop and I want to go and try and get us some stuff," and the rest of the party was like, "You know what? Yes." Do that. We want to see you be awesome. Sure. Um, but it, w- it would be something where I would ask everyone uh, and see if they wanted to. Because we can always go back. I know that's that's really bad. Everyone's going to be like, oh my god, he retcons. Um, but if you guys, if if it doesn't affect the few, you know, the later parts of the game, then I don't mind going back and going over the things that you guys did, like say, um, over a couple days. And, and get that kind of stuff organized. Oh, baby time skip. Okay. But, How um, is alignment going to work in your world? You said right now we don't have any alignment. Okay, what yeah. happens when we do choose one? Uh, can we break that alignment? Uh, okay, so how alignment's going to work in the world is that I run a fluid alignment system. Uh, so basically, as you progress as a character and you do things... Uh, you are going, uh, depending on your actions and your motivations, uh, that will be what kind of puts your alignment, but your alignment will shift and change, and I want you guys to actually kind of keep track of that as we're playing. So as, as we start after the first couple sessions, if one of you goes, you know, I feel like my character, um, follows the law. Uh, the other thing is that if you guys want, before we start the first session, um, I can get a couple questions around and we can just kind of talk about it and go because uh, it's like uh, so like Valdos um, per se I'm sure that Valdos is probably going to be based off of what I've seen some kind of chaotic neutral or good character um, but like say I went uh, so this person gets put into a position fairly right uh, like this person gets voted into a specific position or uh, but you don't think that that person deserves that position. Are you going to follow their commands if they're above you? You know, t- stuff like that. Because... So, what I'm asking is, will alignments actually affect the game? Will you behold us to take certain actions if our characters are... I don't know, evil? Do we do you behold us to do evil... Act, uh, to play as an evil character for everything? No. <laughs> uh, I, I think that alignment is... I, I think that people put too much focus on alignment as personality. Um, whenever alignment really should be morals. Uh, like, what what kind of person are you more than your personality? Your personality should be what dictates your alignment. The, the actions that you make and the, the way that you think is what should kind of dictate who you are are in that in that specific way i think um the character becomes an alignment not an alignment is the character you know what i mean yeah. uh is, this a, is the game going to be a uh, sandbox mode or railroad is it going to start railroad and go in sandbox mode or vice versa uh i'm gonna i'm gonna throw a hook out to you guys obviously um i'll, th- I'll throw a couple of hooks out to you guys but as far as it as far as it goes, there are things that I have planned, but um, if you guys decide to completely ignore that and find your own motivations, I am perfectly fine with that. How do um, how would law how do law systems work in this game? Like, let's say you commit a crime, 
in one city and you go to the next city over are we talking like a um relentless skyrim guard that tracks you down from white run <laughs> to fall creed or are we talking like a are we talking like a kind of like you're only wanted in that city and only if you're recognized um so it's kind of weird because uh with the party that you guys are playing you guys are playing uh 60 percent of the party are all characters that are illegal just for being characters <laughs> yeah uh, just for being alive they have broken the law um technically uh if you're a dragonborn or elf you are wanted everywhere in the kingdom so <laughs> um a little weird on that note but um it is one of those things where um it just depends on the characters that you run into because say you find uh like 16 year old brand new guard who uh has has been taught a little bit of fighting um and is deep in the territory that person may not even know what an elf actually looks like <laughs> um or or a dragonborn for that matter they may actually think that you know uh saying we is just a really really tall lizard folk um where your more experienced guys will definitely recognize you but some people it's uh it, it's kind of like I'm, I'm gonna try and play it like real life where you know just because somebody doesn't like you or just because there's some kind of law against that against that person or character that doesn't mean you know because in the real world people would go look um it's illegal for you to be who you are but I need help, and you can never have enough allies. Yeah. So, so it's the friend of my enemy of my enemy is my friend. I do. Yeah, basically. Okay. But once again, it's just going to be dependent on who you run across. Uh, as far as the laws go, it's going to be fairly realistic. Um, you know, somebody that uh, somebody that broke the law. Uh, in, in medieval times, somebody that broke the law in, uh, say, Flanders, right? Um, they they might not even know about that person in Paris because the, the person broke the law in Flanders. So, and even at that, Flanders might only worry about that person for, you know, a couple months. Because um, if they don't catch the person by then, then... <laughs> uh, now, I know that there are some, you know... Uh, definite hedge cases where there are people that were on the run and, and known nationwide um but that would take a little bit of, of time to get there uh you'd have to do quite a bit to be known all over the nation specifically sounds like a challenge <laughs> challenge accepted challenge accepted how would you handle um certain out of combat actions like this is a huge problem that's come up in games uh, past, but the the typical uh, run round of combat in D and D is about um, like a minute. No, is it a minute or six seconds actually? Six seconds. Uh, yeah, it's uh, about around six seconds. Yeah. Yeah, it's, so it's about six seconds, and usually you've got uh, your average character can run thirty feet, attack at least once, as well as doing a bonus action all within six seconds so taking that into consideration let's say the barbarian is like hey i want to charge down this alleyway uh swing my hammer at the guards and then sprint away that being said that would all happen within six seconds if we're taking into account how combat works so like so, so like split movement and run yeah type yeah, deal you got you can do that that's that has uh, that's actually completely within the rules of 5th edition, where you can... Because in 5th in edition, how a movement action works is it breaks it down into uh, 30 feet of movement to, for the basic character. Uh, it breaks it down into 30 feet of movement. Uh, if you're on a grid, that's equal to 6 squares. Uh, so, like, say you were playing tactically, uh, you can actually move 15 feet... Uh, like say you're using a bow, you can move 15 feet, fire your bow, and then move another 15 feet. Uh, that is that's completely within the rules. 
Uh, another thing that I see that I, I think people get wrong fairly often um, is that... Uh, so for some reason, people think that uh, you have to have flanking uh, to be able to sneak attack with, like, have an advantage. Um, but the rogue, under sneak attack, it actually says that as long as there's um, an ally within five feet of the enemy, you get a sneak attack on your first attack every round anyway. I don't think it even needs to be an ally. It just needs to be somebody hostile to the person you're sneak attacking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as long as there's somebody else within five feet of you that has attacked that person. Or yeah, that is hostile. Yeah, that's true. It yeah, it, it, doesn't, be it hostile. doesn't actually have to be. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be a party member. It just has to be like, say, um, for some reason, you guys are fighting somebody in the woods, and a uh, a bear just decides to start attacking evil wizard dude. <laughs> And, uh, and Zara is right in the evil wizard dude's face. Now Zara is like, oh, dude, cool, sneak attack, because random bear, I guess? <laughs> like, um, but yeah, those those are all things that, um, I don't, yeah, if... I don't know why people have, have such an issue. Like, uh, I have heard that, that people don't really understand the, uh, uh, split movement and fire thing. No, it's, it's completely within the rules. <laughs> 100% within the rules. <laughs> You did yeah, touch on something there. For though, sneak uh, attack, if it says if another enemy of the target is within five feet oh, of it, just, it is just start, another enemy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, as, long nice. as, that, as long as that enemy is not incapacitated, as long as they like are a threat and don't have oh, disadvantage, yeah. um, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Another little known fact about sneak attack, um, you can do it once per turn. Doesn't have to be your turn. Once per any turn. <laughs> Of course, the rogue would know about sneak attack. No, hell yeah, that's why I play rogue. I've I've tried arguing yeah, that I, before, actually, and people like people. I've had a lot of trouble with people trying to listen to me about sneak attack. I've been playing rogues for literally two decades. Fuck off! I know what I'm talking about, but no, people obviously. Yeah, yeah same here. Um, <laughs> uh, man, candle. I'm I'm trying to shoot through these as quickly as I can. Uh, candle has a ton of questions. I don't know if they're all serious or not, so I'm I'm just. Well, so, I do want to have you follow up on one thing there. Uh, are okay. you doing any kind of flanking rules? Because that's atypical, right? At least for fifth. Um, I would say, from what I've seen, the majority of people try to run flanking. I, I actually have no problem with flanking. Um, if you guys would prefer for me to run flanking, we can. If you guys would prefer not to, then we don't have to. Obviously, flanking is better for you guys, but it's also kind of detrimental to you guys in certain ways. Yeah. Yeah, I can I mean, see it being used against us very easily, too, so yeah, just whether or I'll... not we're going to have flanking. If Just remember, if you ever get flanked, be a paladin. <laughs> yeah, you never see people using the help, the, the help, the actions in combat, and they're so useful. <laughs> so useful. Disengage, grapple, hide, help, improvise, I... come on. I was, uh, I had to fight, uh, in a one shot, I had to fight two or three Wendigos at one time, basically, <laughs> and only survived because I cast protection from good and evil on myself. It's pretty nice. But yeah, yeah. so, uh, but yeah. The uh, help I, action uh, is, like, the favorite move of anybody who has a familiar. Okay, so... Real quick, let's get another question out of the way. I don't know if anyone else has questions, but Candle has a bunch of them, and I can answer these as as much as you yeah, want. So, do we want course. flanking or not? Uh, I'm all for flanking. Okay. And if two range, if two melee characters are flanking, can the range characters have advantage, or it's only melee characters that are actually flanking? So it, it's only the two people that are actually flanking, technically, that get the okay. bonus. That's fine. That's fair. I was just wanted to understand. Yeah, by, by the by, the rules, it's supposed to be the characters that were uh, flanking is supposed to work. Um, any character that's within five feet, um, and on uh, opposite sides of a single ind individual. Yeah. Okay. I'm just gonna quickly um, drop this out the way because I know for me at least it's itching in the back of my mind. How do you handle in-game racism? I've seen it done poorly. <laughs> I've seen it done greatly, and I've seen some straight up um not okay stuff 
Well, you do know for this campaign that elves and dragonborn are killed on sight, kind of. Well, yeah, no, 100%. Right? Well, I mean, not like, killed on sight, just illegal. Illegal, yeah. I yeah, mean, once again, no, it just depends on the person. But, punishable yeah. by death. But I just mean, like, in, like, in general, because I know there are races in D&D that straight up do not tolerate each other. You know, kobolds, gnomes, right. goblins, etc., etc. <laughs> that, uh, cool, not, cool. not necessarily like a kill on yeah. sight, but like a, um, like a... Uh, well, I mean, kobolds you know. and gnomes are pretty kill on sight. Like, they do not tolerate yeah. each other at all. Um, so, for me, it's going to be one of the... Uh, it is kind of one of those things, like, I will... Typically, whenever I have something like that in a game, it's kind of like... Uh, do you mind if I use an analogy, actually? Go ahead. So, uh, in in the... Uh, my, my One of my other worlds that I've created, Ervin Dow... Um, in many different parts of the world, uh, slavery was legal. And uh, the elves in that world, the reason why I have elves so low tech in this world is because the elves in that world were super high magic, super high tech. And the elves were built off, uh, were kind of like a cross between Roman and Spartan uh, uh, cultures. So you had, uh, you know, the, the two kings rule, but they also had uh, many, many, many other people of different races that were slaves inside of their, their capital city. But it was it was slavery treated in a way to where, uh, like in in that case, they were treated fairly well because I treated uh, I treated that kind of like a Roman slave situation. Where I feel like racism is just a hard topic to come out in any direction whatsoever. <laughs> um, but I, I would typically play it as uh, just kind of a general... Like, if, if somebody is racist in the game, they're just going to have a general disdain for the race that they have a, a, a hatred for. Um, it's, it's not going to outright be something where they go, you know, oh, you're a piece of... Sh you know, I, I don't think I'd go straight to, oh, you're a piece of shit. But I would probably show um you know non uh, uh non-committants in in conversation where they're not completely you know engaging in the conversation with somebody that they think is lesser they might not even listen to your opinion altogether uh simply because they think that you know this this individual is lesser for whatever reason um that that wouldn't just be racism that would be anyone that that thinks in that way yeah. All right. Um, and then, all right. Uh, next question. <laughs> so, how Never. long do you think the campaign is going to be? You said uh, it was going to be eleven levels, but how long will that take to reach? So, will it be six months, a year? Uh, that's a really good question because it will all depend on the pace that we move at. Um, I'm I'm a real stickler for for like role playing so if it takes uh like if you guys sit down and you want to have an entire session where it's literally you guys just like sitting just may not not even taking extra time like you guys actually take the time in game to sit down for like two hours and just sit at a bar table and talk and plan i have literally no problem with that um it's just one of those things like it's it's gonna depend i think um we're so I'm I'm looking between level twelve and fifteen, um, primarily because it's going to be it's a low magic world. Um, and after like level twelve, I don't think there's going to be much. There there are definitely things in the world that could fight you, but I think that they're all going to be, at least at this point, just kind of boring. But in the future, we can also always come back to these characters and do like one shots. We can do. Uh, or if we really think it's going well, we can always move on to level 20 and keep, you know, just continue moving forward. Uh, as far as the length of the campaign, I I would assume that if we move at a decent pace, we should, you know, you guys should be gaining a level every, uh, like, three episodes or so. So, like, once every three sessions. Yeah. Um, but that really just depends on on how, how fast we move and uh, you know how how dramatic you guys decide to get with like the kind of conversations that you have and, and those kind of things. 
Uh, so what do you think about doing multiple attempts for a skill check? So let's say uh, we want to uh, pick a lock. Can we take as many attempts as we need, or what? Is it only one attempt? I think I, I think I would consider that based on how how stressful the attempt is. Um, like, if you were pressed for time, I think that I would only give you one attempt because of the amount of time that it would take to try and pick the lock. But if you're if you're not pressed for time, um, and of course you don't roll and accidentally like break your lock pick tools or something, um, then I would absolutely let you you know take the time to, to sit down and uh, like say you were you go well um, I want to take a few minutes um, you know, five or five or six minutes to try and take the time to pick this lock I'll probably just lower the DC instead. Um, if you guys were to just explain, hey, I want to take a little bit of extra time to make sure that I'm, you know, breaking into this properly. <laughs> yeah. Always a fun thing to say. <laughs> but who needs to pick locks when you can just break smash the door them? Down? <laughs> exactly. Be be the lizard version of the fucking Kool Aid Man. <laughs> Basically, I mean, look, <laughs> like stealth is okay, but if you know there's an enemy on the other side of the door, why not break down the door, give him a little scare? Right. Ooh, actually, that does bring up a question. Okay. Let's say there is a section, uh, because this has been done before, and it completely uh, made combat so much better. Um, let's say there's a section that is stealth, and the whole party has agreed on stealth, but we know that if we get spotted, odds are we're going to um, break into combat. So let's say a player decides, I want to... <laughs> give everyone advantage or at least give the enemy disadvantage on spotting us by walking out very obviously and drawing attention for myself so thereby like <laughs> let's, well, let's say they're going into combat it's, it's idea. and you're like hey like i want to like draw all attention on me so that my friends get like a surprise round would you i'm, I'm basically asking are you okay with that okay so um like say uh, say the rest of the party was to go one way, and you were like, hey guys, I'm going to go distract them. Uh, that's absolutely fine. Uh, the other thing I'm going to let you guys know about is that, uh, especially in uh, non-high-stress situations, <laughs> uh, I'm going to allow you guys to, to use a, uh, you know, like a take 10. Uh, you will have, uh, ba I'm, I'm eventually going to have you guys, and I was going to be talking to you about this, I want to get a list of all of your skills as passive and the reason for that is so that under non-stressful situations uh if you guys like say you're in the middle of conversation and uh you're trying to figure out something like uh, uh one of you just goes oh man i want uh do i know this history thing instead of you know making a bunch of rolls unless you guys want to make a roll, that's up to you um but if you were just like, hey, man, do I know this historical thing with my passive uh, 17 history, <laughs> right? Um, in low-stress situations, I think that I would probably just allow you to take that passive role for any of your any of your roles. Uh, which means that Zara has like a passive ni 19 stealth. Yep. Um, so, uh, Zara, you're just naturally very quiet you you have very light footsteps you uh you know you very easily slide from shadow to shadow and you don't really think about it due to your training and anytime that you see people in the real world like they don't always think about the things you know um anyone who has actual stealth in the real world they don't always think about how they're walking and you know the, the things that they're doing and some people you can't tell that they're there because they're just naturally stealthy or they're they're well trained and i i feel like that's a little bit more realistic to what you'd see in the real world um in in passing conversations you're more likely to be like oh yeah man hey i remember that that thing i learned in history class one time uh because you just so happen to be on that topic um i also would allow you guys to purposely go uh, you know, I know that thing. I know I know that thing. But I want to choose not to remember that thing right this second. <laughs> yeah. Right? I I'm perfectly fine with things like that as well. 
Makes sense. All right. I only bring up the question because obviously, you know, Senwi is the stealthiest person to ever stealth. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Much much like a green Drax. He just... <laughs> green runs. Drax. That... God damn it. Okay, so... Uh, if you guys would like to take a break for like five minutes, we can. Um, grab a drink, use the bathroom. I'll let the music keep playing in the background. and um... uh, I'm... I'm actually good, and I have my drink right next. So, um, I think I'm Bud also good, to but I think uh, Rex might be saying <laughs> that because he has to go to the bathroom. Do you have to go to the bathroom? Well, I I want to go wash my face and uh, smoke a cigarette, and grab a drink. For man. <laughs> so yeah, I'll yeah, be right back. Um, also, you guys can definitely talk amongst yourselves while I'm gone if you if you'd like. So, <laughs> all right, I will be back in a few minutes. All right. What type of characters do you guys usually play? Do you guys stick to martial classes or a class in particular? Or do you guys like to do all the classes? I play all the classes, but I will flat out admit I absolutely love rogues. Um, so I, I tend to play martial classes more, uh, rogues is definitely by far my favorite class. Um, but I've played all the classes at one point or another. They're all fun in their own unique ways. I yeah. only stick to martial classes so far. This is my second bard that I'm making. My first bard, I didn't really like him. It was my first character ever. And... As everyone's first character, I made him the best version of myself, and I ended up hating him. So, yeah, this is my second bard. Yeah, I almost never go straight marshal, so this would be very different for me. Are you guys all planning on multiclassing? I heard a couple of you thinking of it. Nah. Mm -hmm. Probably. <laughs> I have a couple of ideas. I've been playing around with different thoughts. Yeah, I could imagine it like conceivably coming up where it makes story sense to do it. But short of that, like, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't usually like it. I just always have a bad time with it. And I feel like, why do I only have like my fourth level skills when everyone else is getting their eighth level shit? Yeah. Um, I just don't have the patience for it <laughs> to get to the moment where it really comes online and starts being really good. Yeah, I feel you. Yeah, multiclassing is... Uh, it's definitely something... Um, you kind of have to know what you're doing with it. Yeah, I already like have especially, a plan. Like, especially... Um, like, when you're playing Rogue, um, there's so many things that are, like, really good to get, like, for the first, like, ten levels, that it's very hard to multi-class out of that sometimes for people who don't know what they're doing because like you really want like evasion that's like really helpful uh but that's not all the way at level seven so it's like at what point do you want to break off from that um it's you have to kind of like uh figure out what kind of makes sense for both for the character and and for like what keeps your class viable yeah, I'm I'm trying to decide still when exactly I want the multi-class. I've got a game plan already set up. I'm gonna gonna stick with uh Bard pretty far, pretty probably to level eight, and then multi-class from there. Yeah, I might uh do a dip into everything early on just to get the uh backstory elements out of the way. Make sure it makes sense. Hey, I want to um, uh, ask you guys. So, like, player to player. Um, what's this? So, the way that I plan on running Sinwi is, like, a very uh, detached, sort of, like, friendly green giant type person, right? Um, not super confrontational. Not super 
into violence. Um, <laughs> more of like the like talk it out with enemies, unless it is very clear that they you know don't want to sit down and share some tea and biscuits type thing. And I just want to run that by you guys, see if that's, you know, if that doesn't, like, inhibit you in any way. Are you I think... not going to be playing the I'm going to eat these humans and dwarves after they're dead, dragon? Well, I never said that. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, okay, what I mean by that is, like, he's, um, to quote Hamilton here, slow to anger um, type deal. So, like, when it comes down to combat, he will undoubtedly his first move, unless someone strikes him, would be to try to defuse the situation. You know, if that fails, then he will fight. Will does he eat the dead dwarfs and elves? I mean, you know, everyone likes a snack every now and then. But I mean, like in terms of combat, his first um, his first option is always going to be to try to like defuse the situation. You. Yeah. Yeah, I I have a. Uh... Redemption Paladin that I play that does a similar thing uh, has actually saved parties multiple times that way uh, but it might not always happen yeah. I think um, I mean, I shoot somebody from a, from the edge of a forest before you have a chance to talk to him yeah what I mean by that is like let's say if like um, if we get ambushed right and then like in the middle of the forest obviously there's no talking with these people but, like, if a fight escalates with, like, a city guard or something, he's going to try to defuse it because there's there's not necessarily, in his eyes, a need for there to be bloodshed. You know, now if some sneaky, if some sneaky bandit steals our stuff in the middle of the night, well, you know, they're going to become a pile of bones and um, feces the next morning. Yeah, I think uh, that's how Breck's going to pretty much run, too. So we'll have two very large green fellas. Getting into people's business before any fight actually starts, unless you know, situation calls for it and things will be different. But I think it's especially in like a more social campaign. Like it seems like we probably don't want to go around doing a whole bunch of murders and then get that kind of reputation if we're trying to go into any town. Personally, I think um, part of the fun D and having people that don't react to the same situation the same way and having the characters try and like figure out how to resolve those situations like agreed if, if everybody's doing if everybody's gonna be doing the same thing all the time then that's gonna get boring i think it's more interesting when it's like one person does one thing that's completely the opposite of what somebody else would do like well now how do we deal with the situation um so i don't think there's any combination that's like can't be worked around that's part of the game from my perspective is like figuring out like oh how how do we make this work um that said like i'm playing an assassin um, yeah like I'm, I'm not interested in killing every person i meet but if i get to the point where it's like okay i think this is going to be a fight like her first instinct is like if we're past that threshold then she's going to try and like the whole point of that assassin mindset is taking them out early before they get any any chance to build momentum. So by the time like she's done acting first round, it's sure be like a crap ton of damage being done to the point where like somebody should be dead. Yeah. Um yeah, like the whole goal is like kill the person in the first hit. So that even if you fail, like you're at a huge advantage for the rest of the fight. So she's gonna be like, if it gets to that point, her basic combat tactics is already, like, escalating. Um, yeah. So... But that's not to I say think, that... I think that's what makes it interesting. ...talk me out of shooting them first and asking questions ever. Yeah, especially if they've been traveling for a long time, you know. But I guess, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that's okay with you guys, because Senwi would not always... Um, I guess to put it this way... Senwi isn't always going to participate in combat. I know that there's been a few games where that's happened where people get really mad at that. Like, let's, you know, usually because the parties consist of a lot of spellcasters and they're usually one or two heavy hitters. So if one of those heavy hitters just, like, decides, you know, he's not going to participate in this fight, it usually throws off the balance. So I just wanted to let you guys know that due to certain character restraints, Senwi isn't always going to be the, um, 
hammer first, ask questions second type person. I was going to say, Breck is kind of the same way, where uh, Breck... So what, what, I, what I find interesting is, like, uh, Breck is a barbarian, but Breck's first instinct is more, you know, talk it out if he can, uh, from what I understand, due to, like, the background and the things that I've been sent. Yeah, combat actively scares Breck. We have a, well, you guys will see it in combat, but I've got a different rage flavoring. So yes. it'll, work, it'll work a little bit different. Um, but, like, instinct for him is going to be first talk it out and then second defend his friends. So it'll come down to that kind of deal where it's not so much a, if the fight ends without everyone dying, but I get you guys out of there, and we that's a fine outcome for Breck most of the time. I don't it see be for you guys. That's just going to be where his head's at. Yeah, I know at least. For I don't see why people. one has to preclude the other. While you guys are trying to talk down the the, the situation, Zaru could get into position. If and if things go wrong, she'll just slaughter one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was know, gonna well, say like if anything, I I would worry about like would you guys be bothered by the fact that like if we get into this particular situation where it's very heavy and I decide like okay, Zara would she's reached that threshold. Like while you guys are trying to defuse the situation, she's assassinated people. because um, well, no, she's no, like, no, I'm that's... taking advantage of this because like what I want to get them while they're surprised, while they're not expecting it, and take them out and effectively using you guys as a distraction. Well, yeah, no. no, that's that's in character. That's fine as long as it's not like a um as long as it's like a situation where every single time we try to talk our enemies down, you come up and gank them from behind. As long as it's not that situation, then that's fine. But if it's like a legitimate like we've been talking them down for a while and it doesn't seem like they're gonna give way, and then you attack them, that would make sense. You know, at least for Sen Wei, he would realize that you know it was the only option. And hey, at least now we have meat tonight. Well, Keep in yeah. mind that uh, talking your way out of every situation is not going to happen. In fact, yeah. I'd be surprised if it happens more than 25% of the time. On the uh, topic of metagaming, how he was saying he didn't really get uh, players talking about stuff and then instead of having characters do it, I can see that only as you know, our characters, if we're going to be traveling together, would have had lots and lots of time to talk to each other about different tactics and whatnot. See that I find that I find pretty bare. Like if you guys go, uh, like say you guys have been traveling for a few days, and you go, okay, well, um, for whenever we break into a room, we already have a plan ready. Um, that that actually makes a lot of sense to me. I don't I don't consider that metagaming. Even if you guys go, hey, so we're gonna talk about this for a minute, but we like we already have uh things planned out on what we want to do in combat. On uh, like how we kind of want to approach certain situations, that that totally makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So in, in that vein, then uh, as far as the situation for going and talking to people first, I can see that happening. And then uh, suppose somebody were to say to you, "You and what army?" All you have to do is give a hand signal, and then you're going to have two assassins shooting arrows at them. Yeah, yeah and as you know, I want to. Um, I know that not everyone when it comes to D&D, &D, does voices, whether or not they, they're not good at them, they don't feel comfortable fully coming to roleplay or anything like that. But I do know that, in my experience, voices have helped against metagaming, so you can at least know if it's the character or the player talking. So I do want to encourage, um, even if it's like a really, really crappy British accent, I want to at least encourage <laughs> character voices. Really like, even if you, like, I... like, if this, like, just raise your octave a bit so we at least know. You know, I'm fine with that. I'll try, but I can already tell you I'm, I'm a terrible voice actor. Yeah, I kind of uh, follow John H. Benjamin in that. Yeah, I was going to say, like, um, I know that a lot of people... Uh, a lot of people think that, like, that's super important. Uh, like, I've, I've already kind of pointed out that uh, doing the voice, which is apparently the, the thing that people say in D&D, like, you have to do the voice... I don't think that that's absolutely necessary as long as there's some way of knowing that you're talking in character. Um, even if you're like, uh, just having kind of like a different inclination to your voice that you're like a different cadence that your character follows um, would would be a good idea. Um, the other thing is like, uh, I so uh, to kind of be fair on the other side of that though, Meta, you do also do this. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure how professionally, but at least semi-professionally as a voice actor, yeah. you've been doing it for like five years. And so I know that will come fairly easy to you. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, it comes easily to me. And I'm not expecting everyone to right off the gate come out sounding like Mr. Beauregard. You know, I'm just saying like at least like either like change your speech patterns or like something recognizable so that we know when it's the character and when it's the player talking so we don't have to ask, you know, every single, every, just about every single time. Because I know from experience with other games at least is that not everyone's comfortable doing the voice. Not everyone wants to do the voice and some people just straight up don't like doing the voice. So it's not fair to force that on them. Yeah. One thing I will say though is like at this point I like I wouldn't know exactly what Zara's voice is, so I would have to like figure it out. So that might be something that would have to develop time. Yeah. And that's fine. Uh so uh, I'm gonna point this up because I know uh so Meta uh, Meta, have you seen um the uh Matthew Colville video where he talks about um dragonborn voices? Yes, I have. Uh, I kind of have a similar outlook, like his, his, uh, not specific, like, it doesn't have to be that specific kind of voice, but, like, the, the thing of having a little bit more open mouth and, and forward movement, uh, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> um, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to me for Dragonborn to talk that way. I didn't, uh, before you said anything, I was going to let you know that that's how they talked, uh, during this and uh let you know that you don't have to talk like that but if you want to you can <laughs> yeah i know i um i uh when i saw that video while i was making uh send weeks i did like a lot of research i um i was going to have him originally sound like that but then i realized that seeing as he grew as where he grew up and how he um how he would have been raised oh. so to speak he that doesn't exactly because uh, if because he wasn't um, not really a spoiler because he talks about it a lot but he wasn't exactly raised by Dragonborn <laughs> so he wouldn't that's true so his voice may have sounded like that at some point but given his years now he doesn't necessarily sound like that so like he so might have something closer to like the yeah he's got like um, a <laughs> I like I like that you say oh spoiler uh, the spoiler is um, something fairly obvious. Uh, when you find out that Sinwi is nine foot two, <laughs> yeah. Um, I I don't know if you have any problem with me talking about backgrounds at all. Um, because uh, there are some backgrounds I know for a fact I cannot talk about until they're revealed in game. <laughs> no, what was that? Backgrounds. Ooh, oh, I'm stupid. I just realized I gave Sinwi an alignment. Let me change that. Um. Yeah. No, there are backgrounds that I can't talk about. Uh, there, there are character backgrounds I cannot talk about until they're revealed in game. Uh, mainly because I'm going to be using those backgrounds as plot points for the for the story, yeah. for for what we're going to be doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally. I, I hope so. I, I I like to liberally put in some holes in my backgrounds for you to fill in however you want for plot purposes. Yeah, yeah. That's good. I, I um, because I know like I've. I've, I've unfortunately experienced that one awkward time where every D&D player has that, where you have a DM who thinks he has to be Matthew Mercer, and it gets really, you know, you know, because it's it's always a good campaign, but it gets really uncomfortable, or they like forget certain things, where like um, they ask you, hey, write down this huge elaborate backstory, you know, we're gonna do this critical role style, and then they forget it halfway through. I don't. I don't get the uh, the the huge elaborate back. Like I, I I get huge elaborate backstories. I've I've dealt with them for a long time, um, and I've I've done, I'd say decently well at using anywhere up to like eighty percent of somebody's backstory, in game. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like, anytime, uh, somebody makes one of these big elaborate backstories, it's to, uh, draw a lot of focus onto like their character so like a page and a half isn't that bad um but like i've gotten six full pages of backstory before 
Yeah, I feel like I feel like when it comes to backstories, a DM doesn't have to use all of it. You know, like if they like if you write me a full book on your character, odds are I'm gonna use the most recent five years because in my opinion, everything that's happened like anything that's happened after like before the most recent five years has already established your character. It's already built so, who they are. So, so everything else, so everything like past those five years isn't important. What's important is those most recent five years to like establish like why are they doing this? Why would they do that? Who are they after, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise you're just you're basically trying to be um the dra- the dragonborn in Skyrim. You know, you're not you're not playing a cooperative game. You're playing a single player game. Right. Uh, I think as far as uh, so I, I am gonna let you guys know like I have um, I do have ideas right now uh, for parts of the game like I have uh, character uh, some character backgrounds where I'm going to be using uh, very specific parts of their background. Um, I have other characters who um, I love their background. I think their background has uh, has done a lot to you know, mold the character they're going to be playing but i feel like uh some of those people their race and their background combined are more interesting than just their background alone um and using that character's race as part of the story because it has to do with the overarching uh like kind of feel that the world is going to have i feel like that is super important to to what we're going to be doing I mean, I think that's entirely fair because, I, like, your race is part of your background, right? Um, I, I, I'm gonna say I, uh, so I do have um an idea for one of the player backgrounds that I think is gonna be super cool, and I think that that person's gonna fucking love it. Uh, but we're gonna have to see how everything plays out and hope. <laughs> I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope that that person doesn't die before. The- because then I'll feel like a real asshole. <laughs> oh, yeah. Speaking of um of player deaths, uh, I it's um I know a lot of players do some precaution, but handling that um where, where where was my train of thought going with this? How okay there we go. If a player dies, right? Uh, <clears throat> depending on how much time is left in the session. Do you introduce them that same session, or do you like give them a session uh, to like come up with a new character and establish their story in the campaign as far as thus far? Uh, so anytime I've killed, like anytime I've had a, a, a I don't kill them with the whatever creature they're fighting kills them. Yeah, <laughs> but um, anytime I've had a uh, a PC death, um. I, I typically because uh, I'm I'm very used to like what what we used to do was like six to eight hour sessions if not longer. Um, so with like six to eight hour sessions, you could have somebody die at the four hour mark and then go, uh, well, I mean, yeah, I guess I saw that coming. I I did something stupid, uh, but that was just kind of how we played. Is that we. Uh, Like, I've always kind of grown up on the uh, life is cheap. Uh, If you die, then, you know, suck it up. You're, you know, you're playing a game where sometimes your character dies. Yeah. You know, things are born. Sometimes they stop breathing. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes you're born, then you live, and then you stop. (laughs) Yeah. Forever. (laughs) Um, So, I, I find that, um, if if somebody dies, first off, I want to give you a little like I want to give that player a little bit of time uh, to just kind of come to terms with the fact that the character is dead. I know that there is like if you if you get pissed off about it, if you get seriously pissed off about it, there is literally nothing I can say to make that character death better. <laughs> Everything yeah. I say is just gonna make whoever's character died more it's angry. Solid. <laughs> twisting the knife in so I think I think I would handle that by being like uh, take 30 minutes 
uh, you know, t- take 30 minutes, come back and talk to me after game. You know, um, I think I would give them the rest of that game to just kind of step away. Uh, unless you guys know for a fact that there is a way of bringing that person back. Uh, it's cutting out on me. Uh, unless you guys know for a fact there's a way of bringing that person back into the into the game. Yeah, and I only ask this because um, uh, not even going to try to sugarcoat it. I have built two backups for this campaign. Because I fully expect Senwi's nine foot two, five hundred pound of muscle to die at some point, given how I play him. You know, not I'm not talking like a suicidal type player, but in the sense of how reckless he is, I expect him to die, be one of the first to die if anyone dies at all. That's what I thought about my melee wild mage, man. It just never happened, dude. <laughs> we'll Did you, wait, whoa. Hold on, we gotta step back for a second. Did you say a fucking melee wild mage? <laughs> Mountain dwarf, so he had armor. Ooh, uh, fuck yeah, yeah, dude. His whole thing was he was very overconfident. And he resulted in other players' deaths, which I felt terrible about. Uh, but never his own. Not his own. Just I, uh, kept going. That reminds me, I played. Um, if anyone's ever seen the awesome show Samurai Jack, um, yep. I, built, I built a Warforged bard that was basically Scaramouche. Um, he was a he was a bard rogue. Uh, he was assassin called of Swords. This dude was charismatic as all get out, and I pl- I did not plan for him to survive past his character arc because he was uh, he was like a really old robot that had gotten reinstated for a single job and his job um i talked to dean with it was to kill one of the players before we reached our final destination so he would like constantly like undermine the character place traps in his way be very discreet about it um but he never actually fulfilled his mission and when he met his boss he was terminated right but the players brought him back. So I had a, I had a character that was supposed to die. He, he was not supposed to live past his arc. And when he was brought back, I felt like there was nothing for him to do. So I, I had talked with the DM and I was like, hey, I feel like at this point, Scaramouche is going to you know, deactivate himself. There's nothing left for him to do. You know, He served his purpose, this type thing. And I, oh God, I lost my train of thought again. Scaramouche, that's an awesome character name. It is. I uh, love that was, so much. He was lovely to play. Absolutely lovely. Well, on the same topic, how do you handle resurrections? Um. Okay, so this is kind of weird because if you guys would have had a cleric in the party, um, uh, somebody who could like revive a fallen a uh, fallen ally, I was going to do. Uh, I I was going to do something similar to to Matt Mercer, where you would have to make checks to make. To, to see what happens and then uh, maybe even go as far as to have, you know, make it to where you have to basically ask that person to come back and then that person can still choose to be like, ah, no, fuck you. You wasted a spell slot. I'm leaving. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <coughs> we don't have a healer. But without without yeah, the a bard that will do his best to keep you guys alive, but bard uh, yeah. healers, man. <laughs> Dude, you know what? No, wait a second. Now you know that the second best healer in the game is the lore bard. <laughs> no, no. no. The, the, as far as game healing mechanics go, it goes druid because that's literally what they are. Oh man, they fuck druids. Play. Hey, hey, Senwi was almost a druid. All right, call Hakuna Yatadas. Hakuna Yatadas. Oh, no, man, yeah, it goes it, it goes life cleric and then druid. Pretty sure. No, no, no. Well, no, there might be a, there might be a circle that focuses on healing. No, it it goes druid. Um, I'm not sure which circle, but only because druids are specifically healing. Ca- they're the healing casters. So it goes druid, life cleric, then bard. Uh, then bard. <laughs> then bard. You know. Well, like life cleric is good at like shooting out heals as much as possible, but Grave Clerics are the ones that are really good at keeping people from actually grave. dying. Yeah, uh, grave, grave Clerics are 
really, really good at keeping people from dying. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, you're still going to die, but they just keep you from staying dead. Like, you'll go unconscious yeah. constantly with a grave player, but he'll get you back up. Or at yeah. least stabilize you. you. You'll suffer 17 minor concussions in the span of a 30 second <laughs> fight, but you won't die. Actually, that is a good question. How, do you do lingering injuries? Like, um, here's an example. You take, um, like, half your hit points are dropped in a single attack. Uh, and so, like, the enemy, like, crushes your arm, cuts off a limb or something like that. How do you, how, how do you handle lingering injuries? Uh, so, I had uh, somebody last... Uh, once again, I'm going to use examples from a previous game. I had somebody... Um, have a, um, a fracture in game. Uh, they were attacked, they were be they were fighting a Wendigo. And, uh, in the middle of this Wendigo fight, the person got bit. And whenever they got bit, the, the Wendigo hurt their arm and basically dropped them to, to zero HP. Yeah. And so I treated that as... You know, whenever you use that arm, you're going to be at, dis at a disadvantage for uh, a certain, you know, number of t uh, a certain amount of time. Yeah. Uh, now, if for some, uh, if somehow you uh, lose a limb or or anything like that, um, that's something that will go over during, you know, whenever we come to it. But I, I do, I, I don't mind giving injuries that are like missing limbs, you know, plucking out someone's eye. Yeah. Um and I only, um I only ask this because uh I came across some very interesting uh images on the subject of D and D. Um that I'm a uh, I'll, I'll send those to you later so you can check them out for yourself. But they just piqued my interest on how people handle because lingering injuries can also work for spells or as i like to call them you know the the consequences of using magic too much you know it's not necessarily a oh debuff, yeah but it's something that it's something that will literally like that that will happen to your character kind of like the um the dragon prince the what happens when you use dark magic type deal you know you get a like a physical tangible thing happens to you that is very obvious yeah, like if you were to, uh, like, say you were to uh, uh, use the firebolt cantrip too much, uh, you might end up burning your fingertips, or, or if you use um, burning hands as as often as possible, you could have burns and singe marks on your fingers, on your fingertips, <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of magic, uh, how? Prevalent, prevalent are magic items. Uh, magical. Uh, okay, so basically, uh, any magic item in the setting is pretty rare. Um, there haven't been any magic items crafted since the uh, since before the day of cold ash. Yeah, that. So, so they're rare, or they're common, or they don't exist. Uh, they they exist. They're currently just kind of rare. Okay. Um. But I. So my my kind of outlook on that is that you guys are like pe people don't play the game to not be heroic. <laughs> um. What? Like if there if there are people that are going to find magic items, it's going to be you guys. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to have. Uh, have you guys be level five when you know you you probably should have some kind of magical gear by that point? Um, you know, have you guys be like level five, and you're like, man, where are we gonna find this this magic these magical items? And then just have some dude walk by and be like, oh man, you should have went to that tomb if you're looking for magical items. And you, you guys are like, why? He pulls out you know, like the the crucible of fucking some dudes whatever <laughs> and yeah. that legendary item that one yeah, speaking of items like... um how does buying items work do all vendors have the standard prices for the same item or will some items 
uh, so will some vendors sell the same item for more expensive, some for least expensive? Do vendors haggle for prices, or maybe it's only some of them do? Uh, vendor, uh, you are able to haggle for prices with vendors if you go into a vendor, depending on the location. Uh, like, say, if you're in, in a city, and it's not a like super high-demand item, uh, you might actually be able to get it cheaper in the city than you would... Uh, so, like, you're... I, I would consider the um, the the people that run like general stores out on the fringe are going to be the people selling it for higher uh, for a higher cost unless it's something that's like produced in the area. Um, at the in that case, you guys would be able to haggle them down uh, from there. Yeah. Um. Actually, on that subject, I know that it. I don't know if it's still a thing in Five E, but I know in earlier editions. Wizards were able to add enchantments to weapons for like a certain cost of gold, and they they could give it like charges. For example, um, like a a like a a wizard could like add an enchantment of fire, um, using one of their spell slots to a weapon, giving it like one charge or two charges depending on the level. Um, okay, yeah, I know I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. Uh, so. The outright like crafting of magical gear, um, and and things like adding charges. I don't believe, because uh, I know back in uh, three point five and Pathfinder, there were weird things where you could um, uh, like you could cast a spell through your sword, um. And you, you could kind of do weird things like that. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how that works in 5th edition. I haven't seen any actual rulings on, on stuff like that. So I would, I'm would i just going to say, if, if we can find a way to make it work, then we'll make it work. Um, if, it, if it seems to be, uh, you know, too complex... Uh, unless, you know, if, unless you guys can find forging rules and then... Um, because there's not really anyone to train people on how to forge magical items. Uh, if you guys find, uh, like find old documents or, you know, old books somewhere in some ruin that you go diving into that has that information and you guys take the time during your downtime to study and learn how to do those things. Um, and there, there is absolute rules on it. Yeah, we, we can absolutely do that. Yeah. So for more uh, items questions, uh, how does items work? So let's say we wipe out a group of hobgoblins and one of them has a chainmail. Would Senway be able to wear this chainmail even though it's three sizes bigger? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, that's, actually, that's a good question. I, I hate the um the whole trope of one size fits all armor. It, it would make sense for similarly sized <laughs> players, but like so, if, like if I kill a goblin and it's wearing some plus three plate armor, that would barely be a uh, Sinway. A uh, Sinway. Uh, if you kill a goblin and it is so, um. See, that's actually a good question because uh, it's kind of hard to answer because part of it depends on how, uh, especially with magical gear, how you want to run it. Because magical gear, uh, I think a lot of DMs just go, hey, it's magical. Um, when you put it on, it just fucking stretches to fit you. It's fine. <laughs> right? Because they don't want to go through the whole thing of, uh, like, oh yeah, this is made for a medium creature, but Sinway, you're medium and you're fucking three times the size of a normal person. <laughs> you know, um, bulk wise. I think they actually added that to the rules of 5e to where yeah, you can so the same size. But I mean, yeah, like I regular guess... stuff, like chainmail or plate armor. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be like completely honest. If you guys find like chainmail, just standard chainmail. And, uh, you know, somebody that, if it's on a medium creature, uh, somebody normal size, because bugbears are, are pretty big. They're like six feet tall. 
Yeah. Right. So it's not like bugbears are are tiny creatures. They are pretty big. So um, most of you can wear it, but I'm gonna say that if you guys pull something off of like a bugbear and swim in ways like. Oh, that might be better than my armor. No, Sinway, you're not wearing that because you're basically a giant. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, <laughs> to be fair, anything's armor if you're if you're clever enough. But I don't think, like, if I, like in all honesty, now, I don't think if I killed a dwarf and I took his armor, <laughs> I honestly believe that that if I put it on somehow, I I. I believe that I should only get half the benefits of that because I'm basically wearing a crop top or, or a loin. I mean, if you a dwarf, take his armor, you probably tr to a very fancy gauntlet. Mm, that's yeah. true. I, yeah, I you'll like... probably use it as knee pads instead of actual armor. I like that this is going to turn into a running joke where every time you guys like, you guys got to go to fight something and then you're going to be like, wait, is it wearing armor that we can put on Sinway? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not even gonna lie. I feel like at the, at this point, Senwi has to like buy custom made armor just to fit him, because that's. I mean, he's. I can just imagine the entire group runs into like a a giant flame demon with like massive brass armor, and we're looking at it like, wait a minute, that looks like it could fit Senwi. Let's kill this guy. I, I think that could fit Sidway. Like, that's the only reason why I want to kill them. Like, it looks like this armor will fit him. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, now, undoubtedly, this thing just... will kill seven of us, but send me to find wear some armor. <laughs> that, time, yeah. that time we fought a demon and it killed seven out of five of us. <laughs> Would we have to, like, buy, like, half a dozen chain mails and then tie it all all together for Sinway to be able to wear it? Yeah, so it any, any, of, by, um... any of Sinway's armor is going to cost more. Like, it is going to yeah. cost a little bit more to make. Yeah, I have, I do have it. Um, it's it's a it's more of an aesthetic more than actual like being actuality. But Senwi's chainmail is made from actual chains. His shield is like <laughs> the his shield is like a um like from a a massive barrel of ale, and his hand axes look like battle axes. His warhammer looks like um a slab of rock. So into like, a baby tree, but <laughs> that so it looks that's, so that's what it looks like. But so in functionality, it's still the weapons. Aesthetically so they, they, speaking, it's the same. It it's basically uh, aesthetically speaking, everything's just bigger for Sinway. Yeah, Every, <laughs> uh, just it's like, like Barting, Texas, everything's horse. bigger with Sinway. It's like Barting a horse. Basically. So, how do we feel about material components for spells and stuff? Ooh, okay, I mean, we did. The general rule is like you can usually usually will have either a focus or a component pouch that you can just assume has all the material components. Well, and, that is. And I. It's mainly just the uh, the only things that you need to worry about technically are the basically any materials that are either a consumed by the spell um, that that also be have a monetary cost. Yeah, I was gonna if, say. Right, as far as component pouch, do you have to still find the components and have them in the pouch for this? Because you're gonna run out of it. <laughs> okay, Especially if you so, can't go to a town and buy it. I'm just I'm just gonna be very, very honest about this. I'm I'm terrible at um I'm terrible at keeping track of people using uh their their components. Because uh, so first off, I'm not I personally don't play spellcasters very often. So it's really hard for me to to remember that even though I, I like I know tons of material components, I just don't always think about the fact that they're needed. <laughs> so um, a lot of the time I actually I've had great players in the past who just kind of go, yeah, by the way, I'm going to make sure to get like component pouches and, and the, the like. Um, but if I, I just want you guys to make sure that you're you're kind of keeping track of your characters and then if you go hey I am starting to run out of this um, I also don't mind you guys you know maybe trying to find it if it's a component that can be found in nature um, I don't mind that either so you guys uh, and and just making it easy and going hey can we spend uh, four hours looking for these components to put back in my component pouch I don't think I would have any problems with you guys 
you know, purposefully taking some downtime to do that. Um, luckily, you guys only have one spellcaster right now, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, but yeah, if you get end up getting anything that's like a hu uh, larger cost, like uh, you need... Uh, I know that there's one that requires... Uh, you know, there's things that require like rings that cost at least a certain amount. There's things that require like diamonds that cost a certain amount. Um, and and we'll use the item. And if, well, if it's... A... I have a good example for you. Uh, you said earlier that you use protection from good and evil to save yourself. Yes. All right. So I'm in a campaign where there's uh, very little holy water to go around. And so I wasn't able to use it. But uh, even though it doesn't have a cost listed, they considered it one full vial of holy water instead of a sprinkle. And so it worked itself out to something like five pounds of powdered silver. What? That's yeah, crazy. It, because that was the cost of the powdered silver as opposed to the vial of holy water. Yeah. I know, um, wow. I do know that there's like in D&D, &D, and I watched the animated spell book to kind of have about this stuff, but unless it is um, stated in the spell, when you spend a material component, you still have it. But, well, I've, had, but I've had like DMs that'll say, well, yeah, you still have it, but eventually it's going to like be used up or eventually like just the sheer magical energy that's running through it is going to cause it to be you know like to eventually like combust well see that that's why i'm bringing up protection from good and evil specifically because yeah. one you've used it before and it has no cost but it's still consumed so how would you handle yeah. something like that uh i i was gonna say i i would say that if you uh like if you know for a fact that you don't have the material components, because um, I know I know that there are some DMs that allow you to be like, okay, well, um, we'll just say <coughs> that you were kind of aware on your shortage, so if you spend the gold, you can just do it, right? Um, which I I don't think I'd have too much of a problem with that, um, but it's something where you know. Uh, if, if say, you went, well, that's one of the things I wanted, like, uh, whenever we were talking about the downtime earlier and doing the, uh, like, shopping or, you know, the, the in-between session kind of things where we, you guys might be in town for a few days and you have some downtime, um, but want to continue moving forward with the story instead of, wait, you know, if you guys don't want to do downtime activities in-game, um, Say you guys were to, to go out and then you get into a fight and you go, well, we had this time during our downtime. Um, I'll make sure to take it out of my gold. Do you mind if I picked this item up during that downtime since we had a couple of days? That's something that's totally, totally fine with me. Um, I, I figure that you guys are going to try your best to restock when you're in town. Um, and I know you guys are all starting out currently with, like, literally no gold. <laughs> um, you all are at between 10 and 25 silver pieces. Uh, I do plan... that. That's something for... Uh, to, to kind of represent the fact that you guys have been traveling. Uh, and that you guys have been using your money for other things. Uh, whenever you come into towns, towns and stuff. Uh, or you've lived in a location where you weren't really able to get the gold pieces that you would normally get just due to uh, race or background. Yeah, I do actually. So on the um, topic of background, because I know that um, not everyone really knows how it works specifically. Uh, let's say like there is a specific feature for background, like um, for example, let's say, like, thief or rogue or, like, uh, no, it's um, spy. spy uh, criminal? It's, it's the criminal yeah. background. And yeah, the get, criminal background. Like, um, they usually have, like, a contact or someone, or, like, they yes. know where you can get fence goods. So, like, let's... Or there's also um, the haunted one background, which isn't used as often. But it's, like, like usually people or, like, also the pirate background. Usually they can get away with small crimes because people don't necessarily want to mess with them because they have a reputation of stab first, yeah. ask questions. 
Right. So would would that affect the way that um, that the world works? So obviously this is not his background, so I'm going to use it. Let's say Senwi is has the criminal background, so he can get away with small crimes. Like if he like if he starts a bar fight, um, and then steals some gold off of the guys, he knocks unconscious in broad daylight. Uh, mechanically speaking, no one is really going to call the guards on him. Because he would have a reputation of, you know, being a very cutthroat person. But if one of the other party members was to do it, like, say, someone with a scholar background, you know, they would have the guards called on them. Would, how, I guess I'm asking, how would you translate that into the game? Um, so as far as, like, uh, uh, since the criminal background was the one being, uh, being used, I, I'm going to say that at level, uh, at lower levels... Um, it's most likely going to be your contact that people are more worried about than you. Yeah. Um, like, uh, I, I would assume that if you have a contact, uh, then that person's name is going to be... Like, you're, you're going to be able to use that person's name. So, yeah. like, if you guys beat people down and then, uh, you know, you had, like, Zara... Uh, I don't know what Zara's background is as far as the oh i'm a criminal criminal okay that's what i thought uh so mm -hmm. like say zara goes uh well you know that's why you don't mess with the friends of uh of like nikolov uh for Cess, and people are like oh my god you know that person because they're a well-known criminal they're um they're somebody that's going to be like a well-known fence and somebody who uh, and i know that sounds kind of crazy but fences and um you know your your higher ranking criminals they were typically very dangerous people uh fences are super dangerous people <laughs> you do not back in the olden days if you knew a fence you weren't messed with and you didn't mess with a fence <laughs> yeah they were they were usually feared more than the actual gang leaders themselves because of how much traffic they got well it's it's because they they had control over the uh the money flow they were the ones who, yeah. um, like, if you don't like the price that they're they're offering you, then they just uh, so this this happened a lot in um, uh, seventeenth uh, and eighteenth century London, um, where a fence would just literally go, oh, you don't like my price? Well, I'll just sell you to a constable. Uh, I'll, I'll just sell you to a constable and. Um, you know, get my 40 pound and you can fuck off. <laughs> yeah, I know that, like, um, like, there's a really bad example, but, like, it was to the point where, like, if, like, let's say, like, a mob boss didn't, like, offenses prices, it's like, oh, you're Don Monte Carlo? Cool. Let me pay, like, 20 bucks to get you killed, then. Because I know Don Francisco type, type deal, you know? Yeah. They were, they were, like, they were neutral ground, almost. Yeah, fins, fences typically don't get messed with, because um, they're they're dangerous. They're uh, they typically have criminals that work for them, uh, you know, thug types. Uh, the other thing is that uh, as as much as we wouldn't want to admit it, and this is something kind of true of uh, of pretty much any time period. So back in um, uh, back in early Europe, there weren't uh, like whenever you think of a city guard um those people literally were the people that were stationed on walls of castles um to you know notify somebody if a big fucking army was heading their way um they they weren't there uh for the most part they weren't there for any kind of civil justice so uh they, they typically, if, if somebody was a thief, it was left to, uh, like, if, if somebody was a criminal, it was left to the people to deal with it. And, uh, you know, as, as much as I like the idea of, like, the criminal background and having the ability to, like, no offense or, or things of that nature, I think that, um, in general, if a bunch of people watch... You know, uh, like a bunch of people around watch six people literally kick the shit out of these people that they know go out and kill monsters. 
like people in town are, aren't going to mess with adventurers. They're going to go, well, these people are obviously a higher class than us. Uh, we we shouldn't be messing with people of a higher class than us. Why why am I even going to step in? Uh, yeah. These these guys yeah. will probably kill me if I try to stop them. Yeah, kind of to, to quote <clears throat> Bert, uh, to Bert, quote Bert Kirshner, the machine. It's like a big dick in the locker room. Just whoa, he's here, type deal. Yeah, basically. Yeah, but that would all right. A while. Sorry, guys, I'm gonna have to leave. I'm I need to get up pretty early tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, but I was thank say, you for answering my questions, man. Yeah, not a problem. Um, do you guys want me to go ahead and uh, so I'm I'm gonna go ahead and get this finished up then. Um, yeah. So uh, next game, uh, we are going to be uh, and I'll I'll fill fill candle in on uh, everything I go over here uh, with you guys. So uh, next game, uh, we are going to be or the beginning of next session. Uh, obviously, we're going to be starting the game, and um, our next episode uh, is going to be uh, most likely called something along the lines of "It Started in a Tavern." Uh -huh. <laughs> <coughs> I did it. I did it. Um, and unlike most tavern starts, this is going to be a uh, we are going to have a hot start in the tavern. <laughs> All right. Now, I do have one question. What is the average door height in this world? Because... Uh, not big enough. All right. Because Just purely... like everything else in the world whenever it comes to you. All right. Because purely for community <laughs> effects, I have to know that because I, I have a thing with Senwi. You know, he thinks he can fit the doors, but he can't, so he doesn't duck. <laughs> no, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say probably, um, uh, it, it's kind of weird, because I don't think that there's gonna be a, a specific standard. Um, they're probably gonna be, uh, kind of tall. But that's, that's the best I can give you. <laughs> yeah, because I, I know that... Keep in uh, mind, I, even, even I ended up rolling really high for Sarah, Sarah's height, so... Like, she's over six feet tall. Yeah, because I know at least, like, in real life, the average door frame height is 6 foot 4 inches. So, taking that into consideration, I'm a full 3 feet above that. Um, but, okay, so, this is my final question, and this is super important. So, um, taking into consideration the push, drag, and carry weight of um, D&D, right? Yep. And we, weighing 500 pounds, can carry 285. He can push, drag, and lift 570. So, taking that into consideration, would it be possible for him to be a viable, air quotes, mount for a round or two of combat where he, like, grabs one of his allies, throws him on his back, goes bipedal, and basically, like, it. Like, essentially, I'm trying to think how I, how I word this properly. Like, essentially use himself as a mount or as, like, a means of uh, transportation. Or, in the, in the event that they have a cart but not a horse to carry it, would he be able to do that? Because I know... You, um, uh, things like, if, if you... As long as it doesn't go, go over your pulling capacity, which is something fucking insane, I'm sure. Um, okay. Because uh, I know um, for horses, for um, D&D, &D, is that they can, draft horses can pull 540 pounds, which is usually around the size of most wagons. Senwi can pull about 30 <laughs> pounds more than a, than a draft horse. Well, uh, what, wait, okay, what, what's your lifting weight? Uh, what's, uh, can you repeat that? What My is lift your uh, lift weight? Yeah. 570. 570. So your pool weight is times 4. 2,040. Uh, 2,280 pounds? Yeah. And most carriages are about 600 pounds in D&D. &D. So. Weight at least. You... 
a draft horse. Uh, a draft horse is what? Have you ever played um, Lost Mines of Fandelver? Yeah. Do you remember the cart that had all the all the supplies in it? Yes, I do. Okay, so that means that you can pull, and that that horse can pull that cart with no problem, right? Yeah. Uh, so that means that you can not only pull that cart, but you can actually do it better than the horse did. <laughs> <laughs> So what I'm hearing is, even though, because obviously his speed is less than a draft horse, so even though he moves slower than it, yeah, he would I move. Am, I can still. The fact is, I can still pull it. Yeah, because it's still within your. Like I said, your uh, your pull weight is. Uh, I th I think. Um, it's what, around like two thousand pounds. Hold on, uh, hundred and what 120 pounds higher than than a draft horses <laughs> yeah it's yeah my yeah yeah so you so. you actually um like if if it came down to it, you could actually like if somebody ran uh, if somebody ran up to the cart uh somebody ran up to your cart and was like hey uh can i also hop on there and you were like uh as long as you weigh less than 120 pounds yes all right cuz i want to um <laughs> Because cause I, I know that Senwi tries to blend in the lizard fold, and I have the perfect way for him to do that. Now, I'm going with um, dragon fantasy dragon anatomy, meaning Senwi does not have nipples, and his bits right. and bobs are retractable. Meaning, yes. like, like, like with the lizard, if you flipped it over, you'd see scales. So if he was to strip down of his armor, which would obviously reduce his armor class, take off all his weapons and put them in the cart, go bipedal and start pulling the cart, he would Qua look quadru like... Qu quadrupedal. Look like, quadrupedal, sorry, not bipedal. Go quadrupedal. He would look like a very big <laughs> carrying lizard, right? And given how diverse our group Oh, looks, man, that's great. That's an Outlanders. So what I'm saying is... If yeah, I mean, we accidentally eats the horse, we're good. Yeah, I guess I guess that would be the <laughs> that I guess that would be the lesson to take away from that. Yes. Uh, Mental note: that. buy the cheap horse. <laughs> Mental yeah, we, note: we literally have we literally have a free horse. Mental note: fuck the horse. Uh, not not literally. Uh. <laughs> uh, not not literally. Um, like, don't buy the horse to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. We can buy a cart, we can buy items, send we will carry everything. It's cool. <laughs> but yeah. Alright, with that actually no, that one more question. Okay. So, how do you um improvised weapon damage? How do you handle that? I know it has a set amount of damage, but I've met DMs who like based on your strength or your strength modifier, you can do a bit more. So how do you handle that? Um, you know, that's a good question, because I'm, I don't deal with improvised weapons very often. Uh, because, no, not gonna lie, weird. Um, not gonna, at some point in combat, I may or may not just, like, grab a rock <laughs> or a tree stump and just well, start swinging it around. Um, like, the, rocks... There is, oh, there is technically an, an improvised weapon proficiency, if you want to add your proficiency mod. Um, but generally, improvised weapon damage is always 1d4 plus strength mod. Yeah, pretty much. Fair enough. Um, type, but again, like this is just base rule, so yeah. guidelines. So, Rox can do whatever he wants uh, as far as improvised weapons. That's just, gonna, I'm just going off of the rule book. I was going to say, you can always take Tavern Brawler. I can. Yeah, that's that basically gives you uh, uh, an improvised weapon proficiency. Oh yeah, it does. All right, cool. Yeah. Oh, I know my. Or I might just take something <laughs> that gives me even higher carry carrying weight. I don't think that feat exists actually. Oh, uh, and, uh... I'm, I'm so I guess okay. Last last question, hundred percent. If I was to <laughs> if I was to buy a saddle, and equip that saddle. Could I, in that instance... <laughs> now, obviously, obviously, I, the only thing I would be able to actually do in combat is unarmed strikes and his breath attack. But in that instance, could I be a mount, even for a short amount of time, given my lift, drag, carry, and um, 
I, I mean, I don't, I don't think uh, even uh, how how much is Breck weigh? Breck? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm pushing three hundred, like two eighty. Oh yeah, no, like uh, even even Breck. Uh, this is gonna sound really weird, but Breck could technically ride you. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it would I work. Technically, I think, technically I'm thin. I think that, size. Oh, oh, lean muscle. What I would be most worried about is uh, if you could carry us, but mobility. Like, the average bipedal creature um, isn't actually very uh, accustomed to moving around quickly on all fours. Yeah, I know that um, 100%, like, uh, well, yeah, no, I, I, I do like to be very accurate. If I was to go quadrupedal, my I would like I'm I'm saying as Senwi, the most he'll be able to do is bite, because he's well, you know I I think I think for the the mobility part right um my my thing for the mobility is that uh if if you're down on all fours you're probably not going to be moving as fast as you normally would so I would say instead of a thirty foot movement you'd have either a fifteen or a twenty foot movement that's something that uh that call may change throughout the game. Um, yeah. because I might not remember that I went, you know, two games ago when you did that, I went, oh yeah, you know, you can have somebody on your back and move 20 feet. But this game I go, oh, you know, you have somebody on your back. It makes sense that you move half speed. Um, you know, that, that could vary unless you guys, Hey, uh, you know, two sessions ago, he did the same thing, was able to move at this. I'd, I'd probably just be like, oh yeah, okay. That seems fair then. <laughs> I, I think that, the half that... speed for crawling still makes sense. Yeah, it, it seems fair to me that if I start crawling, my speed would get halved, considering I, I'm a bipedal creature. But, but yeah, the the reason why I ask um, Brex weight is because the only other uh, the only other people in the party are, uh, you know, <laughs> probably going to be lighter than Breck. I'm sure uh, no one else in the party weighs 300 pounds. No. Um, you See, know, we could... We could ride into battle as the lean green muscle machine. So, like, uh, <laughs> uh, one of you guys could. I mean, he has a, a lifting weight of 570 pounds. You can literally just sit on him and he would be fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, he could carry. Uh, he could probably carry you at. Uh, I, I think Breck would be the one you'd have the most problems with because of the fact that he weighs close to 300 pounds. Um, yeah. But if, if, the, if the person was. You know, uh, I I think uh, like Val uh, Valdus of the <laughs> Valdus is uh, I I don't think Valdus is quite uh, two hundred pounds. That would that would probably be super easy for you. Um, I'm not sure how tall. Um, Sorry, I'm uh, I'm trying to remember all the character names right now. Give me a second. <laughs> it might take me a little bit to, to remember uh, character names. I'm not sure how tall uh, like Belagorn is. Oh, uh, he and is how how much he weighs, but yeah, he's five foot six and 124 pounds. Oh yeah, see that that would be easy. You you could slight work. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> he's he's easy carry. Super yeah. easy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh Valdos is five nine, hundred and forty pounds, so Yeah, uh, so like Breck <laughs> would be the, the the only thing I'd really have trouble with. Yeah, I guess my only my only quite my only reason for asking that is because I genuinely feel like at some point Senwi would a hundred percent agree to masquerade as a big draft horse lizard and he'd be okay with that. <laughs> so I just want to. I want to make sure I have all the mechanics figured out. For if I did that, what can I do? What can I not do? Obviously, I can't go around wielding my hammer in my mouth. You know, that's right. just not possible. But you know, unarmored strikes would be possible. Still using his breath weapon would be possible. His speed would be limited, obviously, and he wouldn't. You know, but certain things would still be very possible. Yeah, especially. <sighs> That just this brings up so much role play, especially if I got a saddle for him. I could completely just, just yeah. I I'm gonna have fun with this character. I can well, think of a lot of ways to take advantage of that saddle. <laughs> <coughs> I 
I mean, for combat purposes, not right. Not right, creepy. No, right, right. Combat, yeah. <laughs> I get. I get you. I get you. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, combat doesn't always happen in combat. That gotcha. Blew, that blew my fucking mind. <laughs> 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 yeah, actually, you know, how much does a saddle cost? It depends on what type you get. Uh, yeah, it, I was gonna say it depends on what type you get, okay. but I don't. I, like the, I don't like, don't think you have the money for it currently. Yeah, I, but, uh, I, I knew I don't, but like just like a basic riding <laughs> saddle. Um, I want to say it's something so like it real quick. five or ten. Oh gold. wait, here we go. Um, the riding saddle is ten gold pieces. Hey, look at that. <laughs> uh, cheaper pack saddle is five gold pieces. Yeah, but pack saddle is just merely for pack horses to carry stuff. Exactly. I That that was awesome. I think I called both of the cheaper saddle prices. That's great. Yeah, so obviously I don't have enough for it right now, considering we've got silver. But you do have party members. Well, yeah. you'd probably have to guys, get at least an exotic saddle. G guys, give me all your gold. I need to go buy a saddle. Trust None me. of us have gold. Altogether, we have like six gold pieces. I know, yeah. but it's fine. So I, I might have missed that part. Um, <laughs> are you allowing us to get gold from background or no? Um, you guys are uh, getting uh, silver instead of gold. Yeah. Silver instead of gold. Basically, from he asked us to convert all of our gold into silver pieces. So, like twenty okay. gold, twenty silver. Yeah. And also, because I I think I missed that. Um, as far as starting equipment. Uh. I was gonna say you get your uh you get your starting equipment like normal, um. Just instead of the uh the gold hat, you have silver. Okay, but um, like crossbow, longbow, having that stuff is good to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having having all of that stuff is perfectly fine. Um, because well, like primarily because I I don't think it would be uh, nice of me to go. Yeah, you guys are gonna start with silver instead of gold, but you're also not gonna have any gear. <laughs> Um, that would be a very asinine thing to do, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I'm, uh, I'm doing the silver instead of gold, uh, first off, because I find that having gold at level one has been, it, it's almost like you start out kind of rich. It's really weird. Um, because... Granted, you know, you might have to spend uh, quite a bit of your money on, uh, like, if you needed to buy more rations and things like that, you you might spend a little bit of money on that. But I've found that a lot of the end prices, uh, even by the book, uh, they go, oh, a, a simple mill is two, two copper pieces. <laughs> um, you know, a simple mill in a one-night stay is, like, three or four copper pieces. And then that... That could also change by you know based on the DM. They could go, yeah, you know, you get a, a pitcher of ale, um, you know, food for the night, food in the morning, and a room for two or three copper pieces. Um, so it it's just really weird to me that they, you know, some backgrounds start you out with as much as like twenty five gold pieces, which. Yeah. Uh, unless somebody would have played like a human noble, right? I probably would tell them that they start with gold, which sounds really bad. <laughs> no, it, it would make sense, I guess. But but <clears throat> it's that context would make sense. Um, but yeah, it it would have to do with you know once again race and background. I wanted to, I want to try and make it feel um, at least. You know how they have it there? It's like modest lifestyle is one gold a day, and comfortable lifestyle is two gold a day. Yeah, that that's true. Um, um, oh, so that you don't get too freaked out by it, I do have um, I I took five of his silver, converted it into copper pieces just for pocket change. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, 
right, just making sure. Yeah, and um, it, like if you wanted to transfer the gold into uh, the silver into gold, and say you have one gold piece in silver, um, or if you uh, like have something written into your backstory where you might have gold instead of silver, that's also something that we could talk about. Um, but yeah, I, I figure you, so, so what we're doing, uh, just so that I can give you guys a little bit of, uh, like where, where we're basically starting is, um, you guys have all kind of converged into a single location. You've been traveling south a little bit, um, over a few days with each other. And when we start the game, you guys are basically going to be dropped in a town, uh, where there's a tavern. Um, also, I need to know, uh, basically, as soon as we start, uh, if you guys stay hooded. Uh, I'm sure the elves probably do, because they want to try to avoid trouble if they can. Um, so you, um, I just want to make sure, you, so you said that our, our party has been traveling together for a bit, right? Uh, probably a few days. Alright, if that's the case, then send, um... Yeah, okay. And, and, and actually, would he? I'm trying to figure out something. No, no, no. Okay, yeah. I guess in that case, Senbi would be very... would be acting very much like a lizard folk as much as he could. Just to try to blend in when they get to, like, a settlement. Okay. Yeah, ev everything okay. else we'll, uh, we'll figure out as we continue to move on. Regarding uh, that... Um, one thing I wanted to definitely, uh, talk with you about, um, like one of the things that Zara will definitely be doing is she has proficiency with this guy's kit. It's, comes with being an assassin, but, you know, I'm making sure I have that like right from the start. Um, and I definitely want to, um, like I'm planning on her having a disguise kit like ahead of time. Okay, so you're you wanting to start with the disguise kit? Yeah, because I think like that would be, especially since she's somebody that would have been dealing like she has a criminal background. She's been dealing with uh, uh, you, you, city criminal people. I was gonna say, and, I thought I thought you got that and the uh, thieves tools I, with you, the criminal background. Thieves thieves tools are just the um, um the actual tools for like. Pick, picking locks and stuff like that. It's not for well, no, disguises. No. Yeah, no, I know that. Um, I I thought you got a set. I thought no, with it gives the, you, the background you got a set of thieves tools. It, it gives you um, the disguise efficiency, not the dis or disguise kit efficiency, not the actual disguise kit itself. Oh, that's something I want to run by you. Because like some of the things I got as part of like my starting well, equipment. If, I, wouldn't I, actually need like, like I start off with a with a lantern. Um, I have 120 feet of dark vision. I don't think I would use a lantern. <laughs> um, I I was gonna say yeah. If, as long as everyone else, uh, like other other party members don't have a problem with it, you guys can always. Uh, I I don't see a reason why if you don't need something or if you don't want to keep something in, in in that, you can always exchange some of the items that you have for the amount of gold and then uh you know acquire a new item because i think a lantern is uh a hood, uh it's, it's it's just a standard lantern uh i think that's what 15 gold yeah wait is that, are you is serious? That right? uh, if if that's the case i know that there's um there's a few items hold on that sin we would have no use for so you definitely sell them i guess so to speak yeah well hold Give me a second. You I still want us to do half price on that, right? Yeah, I think. Because, I mean, I have a... I start with a light crossbow that I don't necessarily want, but it's also 25 gold. So that's going to throw things off. Well, I was going to say, if there uh, is there a... Um, is there an item that you'd like instead of the crossbow? No, it's, that's the same. Because it that's would be... also 25 gold. Yeah. And all that with the bolts, which is another one gold. Because <laughs> that could get you like more arrows uh, for your longbow. Uh... You know, strangely enough, looking at it, it doesn't look like I start with a quiver. It 
see that's the thing though. It gives me um, cause because of the fighter, I get a light crossbow and twenty bolts, but Senwi is not a ranged fighter. Yeah. So you notice also though you don't have a crossbow or a bolt. Yeah, piece. I'm also not proficient in crossbows, so it wouldn't like. So I guess like, I know the bolts would be useful. You... Um, for like another party member or just to have around, but a crossbow itself, sin we would not have. So would I be able to sell that for the either gold or silver? I don't know how you're doing that, but would I be able to have sold that previously? Well, what, what I'm going to allow you guys to do is like, if you wanted to get this, this is a very dangerous prospect that I'm doing here, but if you guys wanted to get a item, um, of like equal value or a number of items of equal value, so that you can exchange that like like uh, the cross light crossbows twenty five gold pieces. Um, yeah. Instead, if you wanted to uh, get an item of equal value or several items of twenty five gold worth of value, I will allow that. So oh, like so e even for the full price, not half price. What's that? You're you would let us keep the twenty five and not do half of that. Uh, I, I, I will let you guys do the 25 instead of half of that so that you can get... Uh, mainly because I, I figured that if you guys are saying that you wouldn't want it, right? You probably wouldn't have bought it to begin with. Yeah. Or or you would have, you know... Because I'm, I'm still thinking that... Because uh, I'm under the impression that whenever you go with starting equipment, uh, you're most likely buying that yourself based off of uh, things that you've done um or based off of you know uh the patronage of another person but if you go if you were to tell them hey you know i have uh this item and this item is something that i wouldn't use um yeah i'll, I'll let you guys keep the the 20 you know 25 or 26 gold to put towards some a, a different item before the game starts all right so if that's the case um and do you want us to convert that gold into silver or does it is it actual gold <laughs> well no, i'm saying you can trade it for items of a similar uh items of a similar value not the actual items currency. okay okay i just want to make sure all right if that's the case <laughs> then i am going to start with some <laughs> like I'm more gonna, more I'm... rations or yeah all right, so just so you're aware, I'm getting rid of a bunch of stuff that uh, Zero just wouldn't have. Like, yeah, lanterns have a maximum range of like sixty Six, feet. Sixty feet. Yeah. So, um, thir thirty feet of uh of light, uh, thirty feet of low light. Yeah, so they're they're like a lantern's going to be more is more likely going to be annoying rather than useful. <laughs> Yes. Probably. So she just would not have that. So I got so, rid of that. And a bunch of other stuff that. Um, yeah, I don't like. I just got rid of in exchange for a disguise kit. Yeah. Um, can you guys? Uh, can you guys also like? If I don't let him know, let Candle know that as well. That if there's any items that uh, he doesn't want, he can trade them for something of equal value or. Uh, multiple items of equal value. The only reason why I'm doing that is because I want to make sure that you guys, I want to make sure that you guys like what like what your character has. And that you're, you know, enjoying playing the character instead of lugging around shit you don't actually need. Um, you know, if you're if you're like, well, I'm never gonna use this crossbow, then, and I, you know, we know that before the game starts, then. Why, why should I tell you, well, no, you have to wait until in the game and then sell it for half the price when I could be, you know, just be like, no, you know what? Just take the gold from it, use it towards something else, but use it towards something else. <laughs> yeah. All right. So if that's yeah, the so case, so you I can see my character. I, I got up to date and you can see like what I do and don't have. Mainly just I got rid of a bunch of stuff that I didn't really need and just replaced it all with one disguise kit. Yeah, that's fine. So, so, well, so I, I to, get back to, your, to get back to your other question, I mean, she would have a suitable disguise available so you can walk around town without issue. Um, 
and also like have a hood up where appropriate like whatever she needs to to not draw suspicion like this would be something that she's used to so she can get around town uh, without drawing attention right despite being over six feet tall actually that that might be something that works in your favor sorry that that might be something that works in your favor more than more than against you Like, uh, being tall, uh, it, it could work in your favor in some ways, except for that, like, um, the, you know, there are some humans that tell stories of elves that are, uh, ten foot tall, like, monstrous, fucking goblin-like creatures. (laughs) Uh, like I said, there are, um, because there are people that it, it's kind of like if you have never seen like if you've never seen an elf and all you know is what uh, people have told you that is something that they were told by their parent that was a thousand years of basically playing telephone um, very accurate descriptions of things get fucked can get really fucked up over a long period of time <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, Zara would probably, like, fan the flames of that. She would probably, like, be actively telling even more <laughs> egregious more descriptions more egregious of elves. Descriptions. Specifically because it, it makes it easier for her and, to hide. And they're basically vampires. <laughs> it is they're vampires. 20 stories tall and have massive wings. 20 stories tall. Um, uh, so I, I would like to... Uh, uh, I, I do have to start heading to bed, uh, but before I go, um, I'm going to give you guys a description of a, of a creature and see, uh, how easily you can guess it. Uh, I I just want to know how easily you guys can guess a creature just off of description. All right. (laughs) This is one of my favorites. So real quick before you start with that is... Is your mic cutting out, or is his mic cutting my, out? Anyone else? Uh, my mic is cutting out. Okay. Yeah, uh, that that would be my mic cutting out. <laughs> and that... I'm running this right now. I bought a saddle. That's... Okay. So, let's say that you're a farmer. You see a creature approximately 20 feet tall rough gray skin and long protruding tusks with a massive snout that can grab and grapple and rip trees from the ground what creature is it <laughs> is it bipedal as a as a farmer would i know or no i'm just saying it like uh First off, uh, well, I was I was presenting that because of the uh, the description. I apologize. <laughs> oh, no, I got you. Uh, that sounds like an elephant. That that does sound like an elephant. To me, it sounds like a loxodon. <laughs> Maybe. Well, is La- it, is it a- <laughs> no, it was it was an Latin. elephant. Yeah. Um. Elephant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just one of my favorite things to talk, uh, one of my, it, it's one of my favorite descriptions to give. Um, I find elephants absolutely fun to give descriptions on. (laughs) And so what, what, one of my favorite things about it is during the, uh, Punic War, the, the, the Punic Wars, I should say. That was the first time that any Italian had ever seen an elephant. So, so like, the, the Carthaginians were literally riding monsters into combat. <laughs> it's weird to think uh, of it that way. <laughs> yeah, but, that's, that's cool, though. Well, alright, guys. Good night. Um, obviously, we can talk more throughout the week. And I will yeah, okay. see you guys uh, next Monday. 
do have All right. a couple Sounds other things good. real quick before you hop off, if you have the time. Uh, back in the uh, other channel, uh, got that thing from the Oliphant. If you like those descriptions, there's one for you. And uh, as far as casting through weapons, there is a uh, Warlock feature for that. There's actually a couple of... Um... I know there's a few things where you can have a weapon as your uh, spell focus. Yeah. 